If everybody have a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. I will now call to order the meeting of the Omaha Planning Board. The planning board members that are here today are Sidney Franklin, Jeff Moore, Patrick Morris, Michael Payne, Jorge Sotolongo, Dave Rosacker, Vice Chair, and I am Greg Rosenbaum, Chairman. Members of the city staff that are in attendance today are David F Dave Fanslau, Planning Director, Eric England, Assistant Planning Director, Mike Carter, Current Planning Manager, Robert LaRocco, Planning Board Administrator, Jennifer Taylor of the City Law Department, and Lisa Agens is our Recording Secretary. Our rules of procedure are as follows. Notice of this hearing has been published. Copies of today's agenda are located on the table in front of us. You are welcome to come down and pick one up. The cases on the consent agenda will be heard first. Consent cases are perceived by the Planning Board to be non-controversial, have already been heard, or been recommended for layover, and therefore will be read and voted on without the opportunity for your testimony. If you wish to testify, you may remove the case from the consent agenda. When each consent case is read, I will ask if anyone wants the case removed. If you do, please stand up and say so, and the case will be removed. This case will then be heard in the order in which it appears on the regular agenda after we go through the consent cases. When the case is heard, you will have the opportunity to come to the podium, clearly state your name and address, and give your testimony at that time. And when I ask that you clearly state your name and address, our secretary needs you to make sure you, you do so, because she has to get your name and address entered into the minutes. When hearing cases on the regular agenda, the board will first hear from the applicant, and after the applicant states their case, we'll hear from the proponents, and then we will hear from the opponents. After both sides are heard, the public hearing will be closed, and no additional testimony will be permitted unless a board member requests additional information. When at the podium, please clearly state your name, address, and whom you're representing for the record. Your testimony is very important to us. In the interest of time and courtesy to others, please be short and to the point. We will try to limit each case to 10 minutes. Those directly involved in the case, please speak first. We request that large groups select a spokesperson to represent that group, therefore eliminating repetitive testimony. When giving testimony, please provide new information and try not to repeat what has been previously said. We do ask that all speakers and others be treated with courtesy and with respect. In that regard, please remain silent while seated and please turn off your cell phones. Our decision to approve, deny, or continue a case made here today will be forwarded to the City Council for another public hearing and final disposition by the City Council. Conditional use permits are an exception to this rule. The board's decision made here today on conditional use permits are final and not forwarded to the city council. Lastly, upon the advice of the law department, all communications to board members from attorneys or other interest, interested parties should be transmitted through the planning department so that they are made a part of the public record. The department will then transmit all that information to the board as well as to the rest of the public. Rezoning matters, matters are an exception to this rule. A current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act can be found in a white binder on the east wall of this room. We're gonna move forward with the uh, consent agenda. Agenda item number two, KC10-7-3, Applicant Invest Omaha MC LLC. It is on for approval. Request approval of a major amendment to the mixed use development agreement for Midtown Crossing. This was laid over from our January meeting. Location, northeast of 33rd and Farnham Streets. Does there anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none, agenda item number three, Case C8-16-294, Applicant Eco Storage Investments, LLC. It is on for layover. Request approval of a major amendment to the special use permit to allow scrap 
and salvage in the h i district this was laid over from our january meeting location thirty seven zero one dolman have does anyone wish to have this removed seeing none moving on agenda item number eight k c ten dash twenty one dash twenty nine c twelve dash twenty one dash thirty applicant skyline ridges estates LLC it is on for approval request preliminary plat approval of Skyline Ridge Estates a subdivision outside city limits with the waiver to section 5399 sidewalks along with rezoning from AG to DR and R4 location northwest of Skyline Drive and Old Center Road does anyone wish to have this removed okay it will be removed Moving on, agenda item number 10, case C10-21-31, applicant Miguel Santa Cruz. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from DR to R3, location 5832 R Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none, agenda item number 11, case C10-21-32, Applicant John Pearlbach, Bucks Inc. It is on for approval. Request approval of the MCC overlay district. Location northeast of 138 and P Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none, agenda item number 12, case C10 21 33. Applicant Daryl Wilson. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R5. R5 and R7 to R5, location 2408 Maple Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none, moving on. Agenda item number 13, case C10-21-34. Applicant Dale Barr, JSU Housing, Inc. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R435 to R4, location. 3803-3811 Corby Street. Anyone wishing to have this removed? Seeing none, I'll move on. Agenda item number 17, case C8-21-19, applicant Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition, Inc. It is on for a approval. Request approval of a special use permit to allow large group living in the NBD within 1,200 feet of another group facility. Location, 2226 N Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none, agenda item number 18, case C7-21-37. Applicant, Children's Hospital and Medical Center. It is on for approval. Request, approval of a conditional use permit to allow medical offices in the LO District. Property is located within an MCC major commercial corridor overlay district. Location 8534 Cass Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Okay. Did I? Okay, I'm sorry. Agenda item number 14, KC 10 21 39. Applicant, City of Omaha. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R435 to R4. Location 3813 Corby Street, 3802 and 3806 Miami Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Seeing none. Okay. Do we have a motion for the consent items that were on for approval? Motion to approve items 2, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17, and 18. We have a motion and second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Do we have a motion for the consent items on for layover? A motion to layover agenda item number three. Second. We have a motion and second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. 
Rosacker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Those are the cases on for consent. If you are here for one of those cases, no further action will be taken today. You are welcome to stay or you are free to leave. It's up to you. We'll get moving on with the, uh, uh, the agenda. The first agenda item is number one and it's administrative only. There will be no opportunity for public testimony. It's case C10-20-201, C12-20-202. Applicant Ryan Blumkin requests final plot approval of 77th and Dodge, a subdivision inside city limits with rezoning from GC and GI to CC, GC and GI, along with approval of the ACI2 Area of Civic Importance Overlay District for Lot 1. Portions of the property are located within the Flood Fringe Overlay District location south of 77th and Dodge Streets. Eric. Yeah, so this is on the administrative meeting only. As Chairman Rosenbaum had uh, mentioned, there is a public hearing for the TIF component on um, the next case, number four. Um, so the preliminary plat was recommended for approval by Planning Board on October 7th, as well as approved by City Council on January 12th. Uh, Public Works has not had sufficient time to finalize their review of the traffic study, and there are some potential concerns about the additional trip generation and as it relates to safety um, and maintaining a, a certain service level as it relates to this project. So for the reasoning to allow additional time on the finalization of that review, um, staff is recommending layover. Any comments or questions from the board? Do we have a motion? Move to layover. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Haight? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Okay, moving on, agenda item number four, case C3-21-26, applicant planning department on behalf of the city of Omaha request approval of the 77th and Dodge Street TIF redevelopment project plan. Location, south of 77th and Dodge Streets and Bridget, you're presenting. Afternoon, Bridget Hadley, City Planning. Um, so the seven, 77th and Dodge uh, TIF Redevelopment Project Plan is um, a great use of TIF in that it is helping to take an underutilized site and uh, get it prepared for redevelopment. Um, this is a site, as mentioned in, by uh, Eric, uh, about item number one. There's a replat happening. And so this particular site has been underutilized and not well developed as right now there's mainly uh, storage trailers for Nebraska Furniture Mart on the site and the rest of it is pretty much underutilized. So if you can, let's see, as I zoom in, so here's Dodge Street to kind of orient you. Um, there is 78th Street, so here's the McDonald's site. I think I'll do that right there. Um, and then this site that uh, is represented today is shaded in blue. Here is 77th Street, and then this is Rose Blumpkin Drive. So this particular project will allow for the entire site to be uh, replatted, the 77th Street to be extended, there to be, and let me just show you the site plan so you can see it better. Um, so it'll allow for 77th Street to be extended uh, connecting street to be added and then there's a lot of infrastructure underneath this entire site and uh, the public streets such as uh, sewer sanitary sewer storm sewers and utilities that will be need to be uh, to be relocated so a lot of significant infrastructure that needs to be um, taken care of relocated and TIF will allow for that to occur at this site um, it will be a multi-phase site. This is the first phase, and this first phase will involve, as I mentioned, the infrastructure, but it will also involve the uh, addition of three new commercial uh, retail uses. Floor decor, 
is a, a new retail to the city of Omaha um, that would be located here in an 80,000 square foot uh, structure with mostly retail and some warehousing. And then there's a, a future site for a quick serve restaurant that would go here as well as another quick serve restaurant at this particular lot. Phase two um, would involve primarily this lot for uh, multifamily housing. So with that, I would say there's also public improvements that are involved with this particular project. Um, as I mentioned, the extension of 77th Street, the storm and sewer uh, connections and extensions as well as relocation. There's going to be new ACI landscaping um, all around the site and particularly in this area. Uh, Eric mentioned in, in item number one, there's zoning. This particular project, uh, phase one, um, it's currently zoned GI with a smaller portion that is zoned GC, uh, general commercial. Uh, it will be required to be rezoned to community commercial for the commercial pad sites and GI, general industrial, for existing <laughs> warehousing and, and storage. And then the future site for the residential would be rezoned to R8. Um, the abutting uh, Dodge Street here would be rezoned to add the ACI2 overlay district. Um, the particular project is requesting little over two million in TIF, and the investment of this project is about 13.6 million. Um, it will also involve an EEA, which is an implant, uh, enhanced employee area designation. Um, that is a separate designation or a separate request it is not a part of this application, but I just like to bring it up. It is an incentive that the city does offer, but it has a separate uh, application and review process. Um, with that, I would ask for your approval. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brent Feller, 1140 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the Applicant 121 Acquisition Company. Um, the only thing I'll add, I just want to put a couple numbers and to maybe draw attention to the importance of TIF in this particular project. This is the, the plat that we obviously laid over to allow Public Works a little more time to look at the traffic on Rose Blumpkin. Um, but there's a significant amount of public improvements that we need to do to make this lot even developable. And that's, that's the beauty of TIF. That's why it's a wonderful incentive for our city and our state. Um, but to be just clear on that, one of the main things is this site has sat vacant since ever. And so initially there was a railroad here. Nebraska Furniture Mart has long used it for storage. Um, obviously not the highest and best use considering where it is and its location along Dodge Street. But um, to give a little bit of, of context to the, the numbers that are involved in this, um, there is a 60-inch sanitary sewer line that actually goes through the middle of this property. So we actually have to relocate that line, and this is what will be at the floor and decor site. We're relocating that line to the west. I mean, that improvement in and of itself is just over $1.1 million for that improvement. Um, there's never been water service here, so there's $150,000 there. Um, this area is all in the flood fringe, so there's roughly, I think it's $800,000 of fill and bringing this up to get it out of the flood fringe. Um, bringing sanitary to this site is just over $300,000. Then you have engineering and architectural fees that are $400,000. That's how we get to 2.5 million of just true public improvements for this particular project. Um, our request is, is just over 2 billion, so um, developers eating some of those expenses, but. Those are, those are just public improvements that will serve this site. So oftentimes, like when you build a house and you're installing utilities or you're putting up new drywall, that sort of stuff people don't care about, they expect it. Well, anyone that's gonna take these lots and develop them and place retail, both on lots one and two and the floor and decor site, they're gonna expect these sort of public improvements. So it's, it's again, I, I, TIF is a great way for us to offset these expenses, pay them over the useful life of 15 years uh, the developer, the owner, obviously pays the incremental value on the property taxes. There's no money coming from the city or anybody that surrounds this area. It's all developer finance. So um, with that, uh, we're excited about this project. I think it complements a lot of what's going on at, over at the Crossroads development. Uh, upwards 55 to 65 new jobs that will come in this uh, particular project. As Bridget said, uh, we have plans to develop phase two of this project. 
which is the site just to the west, but we're a little ways off from doing that. Um, so with that said, we're here for any questions, and of course, we appreciate your consideration. Okay. Thank you, Brent. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Additional comments or questions from the board? Uh, construction timeline on phase one. Uh, phase one, so we hope to start grading uh, yet this year, so as, as soon as March or April, and have most of what the public improvements I just described done by the year's end, such that floor and decor and some of the retail sites can be up and at them, call it uh, fall of 2022, summer of 2022. So it's an aggressive timeline, but at the same time, uh, we want to keep this going, so. Thank you. Okay, Eric. Staff recommends approval. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Moving on, agenda item number five, case C3-21-27. Applicant Planning Department on behalf of the City of Omaha request <coughs> approval of the 27th, 27 Leavenworth TIF redevelopment project plan. Location southeast of 27th and Leavenworth Streets. And Don, you're presenting. Uh, yes, thank you. <coughs> Don Tayton, Omaha City Planning Department on behalf of the project. Um, the site is uh, an assemblage of a few parcels <coughs> on the south side of Leavenworth. You see on the map here is the um, now, here's Leavenworth, the site surrounded by the yellow boundary. It's just a little bit to the east downtown side of the freeway. Um, most people will probably visualize this site by calling it the taco truck site. A uh, taco truck that tends to, uh, to um, operate out of that location. Anyway, the TIF project is a uh, new construction five-story apartment building with about 134 units. This will be affordable housing in that the project has LIHTC in its capital stack. In other words, low-income housing tax credits provide part of the financing for the project. Um, there'll be about 86 parking stalls within the structure itself. Put the rendering here. Uh, with another 14 or so developed in the adjacent rights of way this is uh, roughly 60000 a little more than almost $61,000 <clears> in um, public improvements in this project. Uh, the developer is 27 Leavenworth LLC, which is uh, managed by uh, basically Claire Devco, which you may recognize as Clarity Development. Um, Neera Jagarwal and Tom McClay are, are the principal managers. The total project investment in the neighborhood is $26 million 364,000 and some change. The request for TIF is for $1 million, pardon me, $1,877,712 in TIF support. Project meets the criteria of our TIF program. It's an appropriate land use for the area. It's been reviewed and approved by the TIF committee and we uh, ask for your approval. Thank you, Don. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Uh, Tom McClay, 3814 Farnham Street, Suite 201 here in Omaha. Um, uh, here as a owner and developer of this project. <clears throat> um, it, 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 Don did a great job uh, summarizing what we're looking at. Um, here, I, I was uh, here to answer any questions and uh, say we're really uh, excited to be able to offer more affordable housing for the city of Omaha. Um, this would represent basically an entire year of what affordable housing we've been doing in the past uh, decade in mean, just this one project. Um, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Tom, have you got a couple, just a couple questions for you, if you don't mind? I um, assumed you would have some. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably know where I'm going with this. You never let we've me had, go. We, we've asked these que I've asked these questions before of you, but yeah. so I'm having trouble reconcile the, the numbers uh -huh. a little bit here. So, just help walk us through, if you would, um, 
how you're arriving at your final valuation of 8.6 million when costs are 26.3 million, and I know it's probably in, you're using that income, right, that operating income from the rents, right. and then what's your cap rate that you're using on on that as well? So that that obviously. Um, I, I, we've had this discussion before, um, uh, uh, and the this is a unique deal. So this is, as Donna indicated, this is an affordable housing tax credit project. And to not belabor this, because I have a tendency to go on ad nauseum on this uh, subject, the affordable housing tax credit project program was started in 1987. It was actually signed into law by Ronald Reagan, Republican, and it created a public-private partnership uh, to uh, try to find a way to provide affordable housing different than the public housing programs that had existed since the New Deal in the 1930s all the way up until 87. I would argue it's the most successful program and public-private partnership program in the federal government's history. We're about 3.25 million housing units created across the country since it was started. Um, and have, I think, by most regards and people in the industry been, been successful. So very simplistically, the way the program works is a developer such as ourselves agree to um, build a housing project, in this case 134 apartments, but we are agreeable to restrict the rents. We, um, to what's called fair market rents, those are prescribed by HUD every year, uh, and those are based upon income levels of a community. Uh, and so the Omaha metro area has a fair market rent that gets indicated for one bedroom studios, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. We agree to not, it, to, to not charge rents above that level. Furthermore, we agree to only um, rent to people who are qualified, and by qualified means they only make 60% of the area medium income or below. So it's not people that this is not public housing uh, per se, which does still exist, but in many cases was not very successful in a lot of cities across the country, including our own. Um, there's examples, Pleasant View Apartment might be one example that didn't appear to be, and I would, I would suggest was not a, a successful public housing project. Uh, that's where the 75 North now sits, the Highlander project. Um, but that, if we are limited to whom we can rent to and how much we can rent for, obviously the valuation of the project is diminished. In return, we are, we are granted federal income tax credits. So state, uh, a, uh, which are 40, so section 42 credits, what they're called. Um, and then we, we in turn, uh, will bring an investor who can utilize those credits. Very often it's large banks, um, it's insurance companies, um, it, but Berkshire Hathaway has become a very large buyer of, income of, of low income housing tax credits. In return for creating those, they invest in the project and they're, you're, you, they're a, uh, are able to build a project that isn't charging market rents. Are those are those assignable? No, technically it was called a true partner. <laughs> this is a rabbit hole we can go down for a long time. Well, I don't want to. Uh, in, in '87, they created what's called the true partnership test. So you syndicate the tax credits; you don't actually assign them. Okay. It's great for lawyers and accountants. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. Then how you? What what cap rate did you use? We used eight and three quarters. Now that we could argue, and and we've had some discussions even as of late um, with uh, the uh, the planning folks on whether. We should tweak that down a little bit um, on a cap rate to increase that assumed valuation, um, but that's not too far off of what you would see as a typical cap rate across the country. Okay, and I'm I'm okay with the tip. That's what we're here for is the tip part of it. I'm I'm okay with that. It's, it's, it seems reasonable in there, but you are taking sizable development fees out of this project as well. Are you taking those up front? No, so the reason you do the, the developer fee creates tax credits. So the tax credits. <laughs> Again, we can keep going. So the, the, how, the, the way that the amount of tax credits are measured by what's called basis, and you get a certain prescribed amount of basis, and basis is the project cost. Developer fee can be included in basis, so you can create a tax credit from it even if it's not necessarily paid, hmm. if you follow me at all. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's called deferred developer fee is what it is. And so it doesn't get paid may never get paid hypothetically if the project wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do want to do it to create more tax credits to make the project financially viable. Okay. So is that why the owner has refunds from the project? Correct. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe we'll have lunch sometime. <laughs> Happy to. You might not want to do it again, Don. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Additional comments or questions from the board? 
Eric? Yeah, so regarding zoning and platting, um, we continue to work with the development team on those items, and you'll see something uh, moving forward, uh, whether that's a rezoning to TOD or a potential PUR. Uh, some of those items are still being sorted out, but um, you know there is an alley that will need to be vacated, and the site will have to be replatted. So uh, we continue to work with them. I, I just want to stress uh, there is a great need for affordable housing throughout our community and, and jurisdiction. Um, you know, anytime we can get uh, quality light tech projects, I think that's a, a great benefit to the community. Staff recommends approval. Do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Um, before we move on to agenda item number six and nine, uh, Lisa, let the record uh, show that uh, board member Sotolongo is going to recuse himself and leave the meeting. Agenda item number six, case C3-21-38, applicant fused development, request approval of an amendment to the future land use element of the City of Omaha master plan from low, de <clears throat> from low density residential and office commercial to office commercial with expansion of the mixed use boundary. Location, southwest of 20th and K Street. And agenda item number nine, Case C10-21-13, C10-21-14, applicant fused development, request rezoning, <clears throat> excuse me, from R7 and GC to GC, along with approval of the MCC major commercial corridor overlay district. Location, southwest of 20th and K streets. May we hear from the applicant, please? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Darwin Goodsell, fused development. The address is 9224 North 108th Street. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to make one clarification on the application. It is for a CC uh, zoning, not GC. So I just want to make sure that's clearly stated and understood. Okay. It's noted. Yes, so right now we are talking about the property that is currently right here, partially zoned R7 and GC currently. Uh, that property has been vacated and vacant for quite a long time. We're looking to try to basically utilize it by developing it into a community center that would allow for arts, events, wedding events, basically for public and the neighborhood's use to help facilitate utilizing this property as highest available uh, position. With the property being zoned R7 and in, in the area of the residential, it has been vacant for quite a long time. And it would seem as such that at this point, if residential use was going to be taken up on it, it would have been done at this point. I think some of the resistance to actually go into the residential construction is the fact of its location and the topography of the land. And then secondly, you have the alleyway along that one side and along with the setback that you have along Missouri Avenue as it is a state road. All those things kind of reduce the functionality of using the land for residential. And I think the higher use of it would be allowing it to be used in a public setting such as the um, function of a neighborhood community center and along with doing it for the quinceañeras and the wedding events. Uh, with that, we've communicated with the neighborhood to just kind of understand what the neighbors would say. So far, the neighbors around the area have uh, voiced that they are in favor of putting this in and that they were not in favor of seeing any high density housing being put in. Any questions? I do. So did you ask specifically the neighbors if, if they would be interested in, in any kind of other residential type of project, even low density, or was it specific to high density? What, how, how, well, did they, how did they arrive at that conclusion that they didn't want high density? Yes, the question, I believe, was phrased to them in such that uh, the owner was there, or the pro future potential owner, was questioning the people and saying, here's what my plan is. Currently, it's, res it's zoned as residential, and that there has been proposals to do high density housing. Would you be opposed to having it used for the community center? And pe uh, to, uh, the list of uh, people that I have actually signed and uh, talked to said that they were in favor of the community center set up versus having it used for residential. For residential or high density residential, you mean? I'm sure it was 
phrased in high density residential. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Melt Schneider, I'd be the owner. 4530 Manchester Drive, Omaha, Nebraska, 68152. Darwin does a good job. I went out and talked to the residents, and I did ask them their thoughts and impressions on this. They said it was unlikely, uh, an unsightly sore that had been there forever. It does collect trash. Three of the neighbors clean the lot, and they are available to talk about that. Um, I did present it as high density housing versus the entertainment center. They would prefer the center. We would maintain it. This is a community center. It would serve Kin Sierra wedding events. It's also my wife and I have a lot of interest in this area. It's a philanthropic adventure too. This would have a commercial kitchen in it. Um, it would do community events, Cinco de Mayo, Dia Los Muertos, blood drives, art shows, cultural events, weekdays. It would have a minimal amount of traffic. Uh, during the day, there's a staff there of two to three. After school, there would be folklorica dance lessons there. There would be art classes, music lessons, after school programs, things like that. In light of the pandemic, there would also probably be a food service there to supplement food in that area. I have a personal problem with children going to bed hungry. The commercial kitchen, we've also approached Metro Community College about possibly moving or adding on to their successful culinary program in North Omaha and bringing it to South Omaha. They have expressed interest in that. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of talking before they make a decision. So we would be getting with them on the design of the kitchen. There would also be community involvement with the local uh, religious groups and different uh, interests in serving the non-ambulatory population down there as far as food service and delivery. Um, the kitchen is being set up so deliveries can be made. This isn't a high traffic operation. This is one person loading up a station wagon and driving around to a number of people. We looked for a long time to find some place to do this. This land was not originally viable because it was just this section here. This was held by a trust. It has recently gone into an estate situation and we have contracts on both of it and now it is viable. I could not build here with the potential of someone putting a liquor store in the GC there and adversely affecting what I'm trying to do here. So we would own that intersection and it would be all GC. Um, there has been some concern expressed about the traffic count there. The local high school is 2788 students, figuring 12% of them drive, that's 378 cars. This event, on a big day, maybe 300 to 400 people, most of that would be families and people going in, one, you know, more than one person in the car. So the traffic would be significantly less. It's not Monday through Friday. It would be Saturday and Sundays. It would not be during peak hours. It would be in off hours. So we don't think that there would be a significant adverse effect on the traffic there. Um, someone had mentioned the North 24th or the South 24th corridor. I have traveled that. That is an adverse effect on the residences because I won't go on 24th Street because it's busy, so I use the side streets. Um, the neighbors were very enthusiastic. Local community people were very enthusiastic. Um, the different special interest groups we've reached out to have been very enthusiastic. Um, we would appreciate your backing on this project. When you were talking with the neighbors, did you, well, let me, you may not have known at the time. Did you know at the time when you're talking to the neighbors that all traffic from that site would exit out onto K Street, I believe it is? They were aware of it, and they also okay. uh, were talking about um, the street here, because I did talk to these neighbors. A lot of absentee landlordism down there, so we were talking to tenants too, did try and reach out to the landlords. A number of those uh, parcels are owned, multiple parcels are owned by the same people. So a family will own two or three of them. That did happen. They were aware of it. And okay. they, I explained the hours of operation and they were good with it. Right. They, were, they were more concerned with a high traffic flow on a regular basis of a multifamily scenario. I did not discuss single family. 
I delve a little into single family development. Um, my material costs are the same if I build here, I build in Millard. I can't sell a single family house here for the cost it takes to build it. There are better lots available on the interior here that are available that are not on a busy intersection that would be more attractive. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any additional comments or questions from the board? Here. Yeah, so obviously we discussed um, many of the concerns in our pre-meeting, and I'll, I'll touch on those here uh, briefly as well. So please stop me if you have any questions, or I can go through and, and then we can have further discussion. Um, Although office and commercial uses can coexist adjacent to residential um, neighborhoods and, and uses, circumstances of this site make that extremely difficult. Um, without, there will be no access allowed to Missouri Avenue, um, you know, especially with that being an arterial street and the, um, with the curve of that street results in a short segment of 20th Street on the east. <clears throat> For that reason, there would not be any driveway access allowed to 20th Street to the project. So as you had mentioned, all of the access to this site would be utilized from K Street on the north. We have um, strong concerns that with that access to that local residential street only, um, that it could very likely result in a destabilization of the adjacent neighborhood on the north and on the west. Um, 24th Street is a strong office and commercial business corridor. Um, there are currently over 70 acres of office commercial zoning designated in this area. I know we don't have the map of the, of the future land use map, but we did look at it in the pre-meeting. Um, the, the area is designated for 60 acres of office commercial. Um, that's the type of mixed use triangle that exists at 24th and O. So we're already exceeding the amount of acres for the area that the master plan um, accounts for or recommends. The site does have, there's a small note of, of general commercial zoning, and this is a result um, historical small commercial centers that existed throughout, you know, the older parts of our city, um, you know, whether it's the fringes of downtown, midtown, North Omaha, South Omaha, we're all familiar with these small commercial historic centers. So when the master plan was implemented in 1997, it recognized those, those existing zoning sites and applied the office commercial only for what that existing commercial zoning was for. Um, it's, it, it's definitely not common to expand upon those when it's outside of the mixed use boundary. Um, so the request to expand the office commercial, most likely that would result in continuation of the three residential blocks to directly to the west. There's also a small existing commercial node about two blocks to the south you know, if you're willing to take this to office commercial, are you willing to take that to office commercial? And as that connects three to four blocks to 24th Street as well, and then you're resulting in a proliferation of the office commercial zoning, taking away from that strong corridor on 24th Street. Um, you know, I had mentioned all of the traffic onto K Street. Um, you know, with this specific use type, with, with events, indoor entertainment, um, can have very late hours. Um, now with a rezoning, there is, there's no tying down um, a specific plan. So, you know, while he intend, or the, the applicant had mentioned the intention to, to not have a lot of traffic, I mean, the fact is once it's zoned commercial, there, you know, whatever is allowed in that zoning district can come in for, for building permits, you know, the next day, basically. So, um, we believe just the potential office commercial uses and the adjacency of the residential neighborhood to, that we have concern um, and the basic fact that it's not compliant with the master plan staff cannot support expansion so 
I don't know if you have any specific questions or if you'd like me to state the recommendation. Go ahead and state the recommendation. Well, yeah, just just real quick. So I want to make sure I understand. So if if the designation was changed, zoning designation was changed to CC or GC. If the current proposed developer wanted to sell that property to somebody else, it could operate as a restaurant, bar, anything that would allow that kind of zoning. Could be could be bars, gas stations, any um, retail, anything that would be allowed in in the CC or GC, yeah. whatever it was okay. zoned to. Thank you. Now, you know, there's there's parking requirements, there's landscaping requirements, um, so you know, it it all fits into a picture. It's not just open ended of what can be done. But any so other I, questions? Yeah. Eric, are there other? I understand the argument about you know CC, and I've I've made the mistake of voting in favor of rezoning something CC in the past, and without knowing what was going to happen there. And is there a different type of zoning? that could potentially accommodate their use or better utilize that land without opening it up to being able to use what as whatever without us really knowing. Yeah, so the, the department would support a consolidation of the site to R7 zoning. Um, you know, he had, the applicant had mentioned residential and it, it's, it's sat vacant, which it has, it's sat vacant for a long time. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if single family product would necessarily work there, but you know, the department sees that you could do several different types of, of infill housing, whether that's townhomes or multifamily. You know, we can continue to work with um, the applicant or any developer on that type of product. There are very, um, there are limited uses in residential zoning um, outside of the residential. Um, I don't have a full list, and, and obviously the applicant mentioned several different uses there. Now, maybe is there a component that was listed that could be done in R7? Possibly, we'd have to look at it, but, but the big one of having a social event hall for weddings, um, parties, that's indoor entertainment, and that would not be allowed. So, you know, if, if it was to be R7, it, is there something that could be done that fits in with the community service aspect that they discuss? It's a possibility, but you know, I'm as I sit here, I'm not able to pinpoint. Yeah, you can do that one and, and not that one, but but it is it is limited. I don't know. Did I answer your question? I kind of lost yeah. track of what it was. I'm, I'm just wondering if, <laughs> if a layover is better or if we should. If a denial, then if they need to come back and re resubmit an application, kind of how that works. Staff will not support the officer commercial zoning designation. Right. So, if if the question is to go to something like that, our recommended recommendation would state would state denial. Okay. Darn. Unless somebody uh, unless somebody asks you to come forward, you yeah. can't speak. We close the public hearing. So. Um, any other questions? Okay, yeah, you can call them forward. Yeah. Thank you. Give uh, your name and address again, please. Certainly. Darwin Goodsell, Fuse Development, 9224 North 108th Street. I guess at one time there had been a mention made that the city might be willing to look at a PUD to allow this. How would that facilitate us in this process? So a PUD plan could uh, theoretically lock a, lock a plan in place. Um, it could tie down a use. Um, but as it relates to a specific office commercial, we would not be supportive even with the PUD. Okay. Any additional questions? Why don't I... I'll read the recommendation. Let's um, do number six. For number six, and you can still have discussion and ask questions after that, but okay. for, for number six, um, staff recommends denial. I do want to point that um, if the board votes to deny, this request can still proceed to city council for the same request. It just comes with a recommendation of denial from city staff as well as a recommendation of denial from planning board because ultimately city council is the one who yep. ultimately votes yes or no on these matters. 
So staff recommends denial of case number six. Okay, do we have a motion for agenda item number six? Move for a denial. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. For denial. For denial. For denial. Regarding case number nine, staff recommends denial. Was there any additional questions, comments on number nine? Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved for denial. Okay, moving on, agenda item number seven, case C3-83-164, applicant planning department on behalf of the city of Omaha, request approval of an amendment to the Reddick Tower redevelopment plan, location 1504 Harney Street. And Eric, are you presenting? Or? Yes, that's okay. me, sorry. All right. <clears throat> so this is an amendment to the Reddick Tower redevelopment plan. Um, this site includes the Hotel Deco, which is in a boutique hotel consisting of 89 guest rooms uh, located at 1504 Harney Street. Uh, the Reddick Tower um, was developed in 1930 and is a local landmark. The, the Reddick Tower redevelopment plan was established in 1983. The amendment before you today is on the agenda due to the request um, for enhanced employment area, the occupation tax, for the Hotel Deco. This would allow uh, rehabilitation for guest rooms, common areas, meeting rooms, and back office space. I'll leave it at that for the public hearing and then I can okay. do the recommendation. Are there any other proponents wishing to speak? Good afternoon, my name is Jay Klein, 10404 Essex Court, Omaha, Nebraska, 68114. And I represent Ownership, White Lotus Group, and I'm here to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you, Jay. Any other proponents? Were you coming down or just moving? Okay. <laughs> I don't see any other proponents. Are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Additional comments, questions from the board? R recommend approval. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Agenda item number eight was taken off of consent. It is case C10-21-29, C12-21-30, applicant Skyline Ridge Estates, LLC. Request preliminary plat approval of Skyline Ridge Estates, a subdivision outside city limits with a waiver to section 5399 sidewalks along with rezoning from AG to DR and R4. Location, northwest of Skyline Drive and Old Center Road. May we hear from the applicant, please? Good afternoon, Michael Sands, 1700 Farnham Street on behalf of the applicant. Uh, Doug Dreesen of TD2 is here as well, uh, as well as my client, um, Chad Bumstead. Uh, just very briefly, as you can see over on the overhead, um, it's a little grainy, but project at issue is a uh, residential subdivision. The request uh, is rezoning uh, in part to a R4 slash DR overlay. Um, I think the, uh, the planning department's report outlines that that request is in conformance with the, with the comprehensive plan. Um, the subdivision itself will have 37 lots. Uh, that's over 40, 40 acres plus. Uh, so, so we're dealing with uh, low-density 
a subdivision with with not that many lots as compared to the total acreage. Um, as far as uh, the city's recommendations and the report, we have no issues with them. Probably the, the big one on there would be the addition of sidewalks. We have no issue with that. We will, uh, we will implement that so we can uh, remove the, the request for, for the waiver on that, uh, as well as the other rec recommendations in the report will be reflected in our uh, submittals for, for the final plat. Just to address a couple of items that I think probably will be brought up by the, by the, uh, the neighbors or the gentleman who, who brought it off of consent. Uh, the map up there uh, represents the, the stormwater runoff. It's, it's kind of hard to see, obviously, because it's a little grainy. Um, but I, I know there's been concerns about neighbors across the way as to uh, stormwater runoff. But I just wanted to reiterate, you know, you can't really see them. For the purpose of uh, stormwater runoff and retention, uh, under city code, the the volume of of stormwater runoff cannot increase as a result of our development, and it will not increase as due to those those outlots. So there will no be there will not be additional runoff uh, across Skyline Drive to the to the estates uh, on the other side. Uh, a couple of other things that, that I'll bring up, or actually just one more thing, as far as the traffic, any traffic concerns across uh, on Skyline Drive, one of the recommendations is that there's no direct out access from any of the lots in the subdivision, so there won't create any uh, at least hazardous traffic concerns, people backing out onto Skyline Drive. Um, and and the, uh, the density of the, of the subdivision itself does not lend itself to, to creating a high volume of traffic given the uh, limited number of lots. With that, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Like I said, the engineer is here as well, Doug Dreesen, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? My name is Douglas Nodgard, uh, 2313 South 218th Avenue. That's Elkhorn 68022. Um, I, uh, I did bring this to the attention when I got the notice um, of uh, this new subdivision. And um, I don't think anybody in, I'm the, also the chairman of the SID in the Prairies. I have discussed with several city officials, maybe three or four, maybe some of them are in this room, but, uh, and I'm gonna get that later, but uh, there was a uh, drawing showing a connection from one of their retention ponds into our Southwest retention pond. Uh, we had to spend additional money to um, re-engineer that because it held more water than we thought it was going to hold. And uh, we're trying to button that up this winter. Uh, we uh, had the bids out and we accepted them. And uh, I guess I was wondering why we weren't contacted about it, being that you know our engineer is Olson Associates and perhaps Anthony uh, Krejci is here today. I asked him to be, um, I know, and I, I, uh, express my concerns and so I didn't think it would be on a consent agenda so I guess I'm glad I attended. So to me, if the groundwater is not gonna be any more, then why do you need to connect to our Southwestern retention basin? Any other? Oh, I, oh. my other concern is, is traffic and safety and what I've talked to um, and I haven't got much agreement with the city but uh, the, the prairies does pay ASAP fees because we lowered our levy. And uh, I would like to see a sidewalk and bike path along the east side of uh, Skyline Drive from our northern edge to Dodge Street. Uh, the city of Omaha and the subdivision agreement uh, basically approved our subdivision with a path which until recently it was a path to nowhere. 
Now we connected it to some internal private paths um, on our own dime. So, but it goes to the north and it stops. And I challenge anybody, particularly some of the uh, city officials to drive out on Skyline today and ask me where somebody is supposed to walk. And people still walk their dogs. It's a scenic road. It, it is an arterial. And I did have a discussion with somebody in the planning department before, and I said, you know, this is an arterial. This is, I go, I work right at 108th and Dodge. So I take Skyline North every morning, about 5.45 a.m. There's a lady that walks her Airedale out there, and uh, she has nowhere to go. And I'm always watching for her, and it's dangerous. A friend of mine's son was killed on, in 2005. I know that, well, the date was Nebraska play Texas Tech because he called me during halftime, and he was riding his bike. He basically felt like he got pressured. Well, we can't ask him that question, but he died there probably about a quarter mile north of Dodge Street and Skyline. He went off a retaining wall. He did not have a helmet. I get that, but uh, nonetheless, and then to the south, Skyline Drive or 220th, I think it is, there's already been two fatalities there, and it's a dangerous intersection. So I guess um, if the storm water's not gonna increase, I get that, but I also think there's some safety things, and of course we're in a planning meeting, and so I think that the city, uh, the staff perhaps, or the planning board, uh, we're planning, right? So there's gonna be more traffic, it's not high density. I'm not against uh, development, particularly what I do for a living. And um, I'm also, um, uh, but I'm pro safety. So, I mean, it, again, we don't have any reason to oppose that, but I was also wondering if, if that water couldn't be exited to the west towards the Elkhorn River. Because again, every time you build a house, every time you widen a street, every time you pour a driveway, then that's less water that can be absorbed. So it's just, we've had some issues in um, the prairies and we just don't wanna add to it. And also, I'd like to hear from the city, perhaps Eric, if you could address what you guys are gonna do with Skyline because there's another development plan just to the south of this. So the traffic is only gonna get worse. And so I wanna be a record that I, wanna, I would like to see the city do something about it. Thank you, Douglas. I drive Skyline every day, so I know what you're talking about. Thank you. Any other opponents wishing to speak? Hey, Doug. <clears throat> uh, Anthony Krejci, 2111 South 67th, um, Olson. So I'm on. I'm here on behalf of SID 537. Doug just spoke. He's he's in that same subdivision. Um, so in review of this, kind of speaking to what he kind of brought up about the stormwater. Um, so the the existing contours previously showed some of the drainage coming towards the prairies, which is I think kind of where you're leaning on as far as the the stormwater flow is not to increase. Um, unfortunately, the, the water flow actually goes to the south of our basin that we created per our, our SID. Um, there's a, a creekway that used to flow through there um, a long time ago, and the water actually doesn't make it into our basin. So one could argue that the, the stormwater flow currently is zero coming from that subdivision towards the prairies. Um, it, it does, however, flow to the two basins or the two detention ponds that are to the south there um, on the southeast side of the development. So it, it would be um, of our opinion, just from a high level review, that the, the water flow could potentially be diverted to those detention basins as it's already flowing that, that direction. Um, the, the water flow was, was pretty much the only major concern from the engineering standpoint, but um, we would like the opportunity, obviously, to work with TD2 um, through some of their design stuff. I know this is a prelim, prelim plat, um, but as they approach uh, final platting and, and kind of you know design and, and whatnot, we would like the opportunity to work with them uh, 
more. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Yep. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, Michael, did you or Doug want to come up and address some of the points made? And Eric, you're going to may be able to address the continuing the continuance of a uh, sidewalk and, and bike path. So. Certainly, Mr. Rosenbaum, Douglas Treason, 10836 Old Mill Road, um, appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I think our, our concern in contacting the prairies was really um, gravity sanitary sewer outfall. We've got a couple routes we can go going across Skyline Drive. Um, as you guys are probably aware, there's a lot of things going on around the city right now. Putting these things together, you don't always get the most accurate information um, that you'd like to get ahead of time, but we do use the city site and we do try to make the best assumptions that we can. In this case, in regards to drainage, um, I think Skyline's fairly level across there, and it just looked to us like that's where the where the water came across, and that's why the preliminary plat indicates that. As you know, in this procedure, um, Public Works will look at all of these plans pretty close. We have absolutely no issue in working with Olson and the Prairies not to exacerbate any drainage problems in the area. Um, we understand the safety concerns in getting pedestrians separated from vehicle traffic. And we're willing to put that sidewalk in to take care of that. Um, the rest of the conditions, we've already made some modifications to our plans to address those. And we'll, we'll uh, be happy to do all of that. So I guess I'd answer any other technical questions you might have and humbly ask your recommendation for approval. Thank you. Doug, Douglas asked about, and I'm just going to ask you about stormwater going to the west. Are you prepared to address that? Yes. Um, in the GIS, it's clear there's a ridge there. If you just go along that tree line, that's about where the ridge is. Mm -hmm. um, I think Anthony would agree. Civil Engineering 101 is you keep keep the water going where it's always gone. Everything that we design downstream is based on that assumption that water's always going to come that way. Um, sometimes you, you trade a little bit, a little that used to go this way goes that way, and a little that used to go that way goes this way. In this case, that's not the case. Everything drains towards Skyline Drive. That's what will continue. Um, I've cautioned the developer. There's a lot of heartbreak stories out there along Skyline Drive, most of them concerning trying to build on that slope where all of those trees are. Um, our thinking is to put as light a footprint out there as we can, basically leave all of those, the tree um, environmental area to the west entirely alone. Don't push any urban drainage over that slope. Um, Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Rosacker, you guys have been out there a long time. Mm. You know what happens when mm. it starts running over that hill. You get some big, nasty gullies to deal with, and access is tough with as many trees as there are there. So uh, the developers, as, as you might imagine, there's immense interest in this area, and he's um, pre-sold a bunch of stuff and he's told all of his clients that your drainage must go to the east to Skyline Drive so we are we are sensitive to that environmental area on that side um, and we're, we're going to try to leave it as pristine as we can leave it okay thank you Any other questions or comments? Eric Douglas brought up the, you know, the bike path continuing on and stuff, and you can describe our limitations and 
Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously the, the request before us is for this platted area, this 47 acres. Um, obviously we have the same concerns about pedestrian traffic and biking. You know, for as, as beautiful as a drive along Skyline that it is, and for those that haven't gone out there, it, it's a beautiful part of our city overlooking the Elkhorn River Valley. You know, it's true that there are, <laughs> It, it, the lack of sidewalks as you head north, obviously the prairies put in the, the sidewalk with their development. Obviously we are not supporting a waiver of a sidewalk along Skyline here with this request and that's why uh, it's for that reason that we need to, um, you know, get the sidewalks in place when, whenever we can. Um, sidewalks are put in place when land is developed. And so unfortunately further to the north, um, we did inherit this from the city of Elkhorn, and there are not sidewalks in most of the locations as you head north. Um, speaking for what city plans there may be, I don't know if there's a specific project in the CIP that's designated for Skyline. I don't have that information as I sit here. You know, we can definitely look in that, look into that, and see, you know, see if there is any project identified. I do have Ryan Haas from Public Works. I don't know if he has any ad additional information. Um, but looking outside the scope of this project, you know, this site, it's not to the magnitude of, of where you're getting improvements off site. So we're specifically looking at this land and its immediate impact. Now, regarding the stormwater, we do have the condition in place, um, which is number 10, to coordinate with Public Works to verify that there will be no adverse impact caused by the two proposed off site stormwater outfalls. And in conversations with the design division of Public Works, just as Douglas brought up and, and Doug brought up, the Public Works Department needs to look further into those details and work with the applicant to make sure that all the stormwater ordinances and policies and regulations that we have in place are being followed and utilized. We don't want to create, um, you know, a project that that you know, contributes to a problem of drainage. That is definitely not our intentions. And if the water can flow west to the Elkhorn and it can be, the, you know, feasibly done in that manner, then that is what Public Works will uh, pursue, you know, whether it's to the east and as it connects further and drains into Zerinsky, you know, I just don't have that information and nor does the design division at this time. So um, it is accounted for in our recommendation with that condition. So. Um, you know, you can bring up Ryan Haas if you have any specific questions. Uh, Ryan's a traffic engineer, so he's, he doesn't work with sewers necessarily, but he does know more about the issue than, than myself as a city planner. Um, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. We definitely encourage coordination with the prairies, the, with the applicant, you know, with, if Olson's involved with the prairies project, and of course, planning and public work. So uh, there definitely is still some work to be done. This is a preliminary plat, so um, we are aware that, you know, all of these items are not uh, buttoned up and finalized at this point in the development proposal. Um, I will touch, Doug Dreesa did mention about uh, maintaining the, the natural, um, the slope areas, the tree line as it head west. There's a lot of discussion in the report about that as well. We want that preserved um, because we're not putting that, that tree canopy within a large outlot. Um, there are some requirements as far as building envelopes on those lots of what can be impacted regarding that tree canopy. So um, obviously, very steep slopes as it feeds down to the west to the Elkhorn River and, and we want to preserve that um, you know for the community and, and just stabilization of the area so unless you have any further questions from me I will read the recommendation report like just I said. a second yeah did, did anyone want to bring Ryan up okay we're good go ahead staff recommends approval of the rezoning from AG to DR and R4 denial of the waiver or sidewalks along Skyline Drive, approval of the preliminary plat subject to the 22 conditions in the recommendation report. Do we have a motion? I'd like to make just one comment first, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, in regards to, and this is off the subject of this particular thing, but a response to your question about the safety of that road. That property, all those properties along there were developed prior to the 70s. And it was a, it was a Douglas County development, you know, an SID, or several SIDs that did that. And those were things that were not contemplated or required at the time. Uh, as the area has increased in its use and the, and the traffic obviously along those roads, uh, some of the conditions exist. And as, as, as uh, Eric indicated, 
those are mature properties and the city arbitrarily can't just go in and and add all that now that does happen sometimes when the roads uh, do increase like the interior uh, uh, I guess arterials where they do have to be increased to handle even more con uh, traffic at that time those things can be addressed but typically at this stage in time with with that whole corridor pretty much mature with the exception of a few spots like this that we can deal with uh, it's going to be up to the residents if, if the residents along there as a part of the SID um, want to take that upon themselves and and change that and you know buy the property from the landowners if if the if the uh, if the uh, public property on the edge isn't wide enough, that's something to be done. Uh, but as, as a part for the city, it's my understanding that's a difficult uh, chore for us to accomplish. It usually, only if a, a CIP project is identified or something like that that provides funding. And, and you know, as I had mentioned, I don't, I don't know if there's anything for this stretch. Okay. Thanks, Dave. It, and my apologies for saying City of Elkhorn when it was Douglas County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch yourself here. <laughs> Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Okay. Approval of your zoning from AG to DRR4. Denial of waiver of the sidewalk on Sarin Drive. And approval of the preliminary plat subject to the 22 conditions in Chapter 20. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Okay. We're down to just two, uh, agenda item number 15 and number 16, correct? Yes. Can I see a, a show of hands? How many people are here for agenda item number 15? Okay, thank you. How many people are here for agenda item number 16? We're going to go ahead and take 16 in front of 15, just because I think 15 is going to take us a while. So I apologize for you here for agenda item number 15, but we'll move forward with 16. Agenda item number 16, case C10-21-36. C10-21-40, applicant Ryan Spellman, request rezoning from CC to TOD2 MX with repeal of the ACI2 overlay district. Location, northwest of Farnham and Beverly Drives. May we hear from the applicant, please. Hello, uh, Randy Kushok, 14710 West Dodge Road with Lampert Nearson. Here on behalf of the applicant, Club Apartments LLC, um, Joined with me today is Julie with J Development, who is the, the developer for this project. Um, quick introduction to this project. Um, it is located at just east of 81st and Dodge Street, north or kind of tucked between Dodge Street and Farnham Drive. Um, it's a former uh, village inn site and a motel in that location. Um, as you all know, this area has had some um, mass transit upgrades with the Omaha rapid bus transit system and as part of that planning has brought forward a new tool for us with a zoning category with the TOD zoning um, this project looks to rezone from the existing CC and CC with an uh, ACI overlay along Dodge Street to the TOD zoning um, category um, at this time the applicant is working with city staff towards meeting the criteria of that zoning. Um, here's a little bit larger view of that site to bring some multifamily to that corridor, um, working within the bounds of the, the zoning. And I believe uh, next month you should likely see uh, a further request um, in regards to TIF for that site as well. Um, the plan currently is around 175 units, a five-story, four uh, podium style project um, with parking enclosed um, with access primarily off of Farnham Drive um, but also working with some pedestrian access and bringing that access to those uh, those transit stops along Dodge um, a very good infill project and utilizing that new TOD zoning are you done Randy 
Okay. Yeah. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Questions, comments from the board? Eric. Yeah, so this is our second um, request at the planning board level for a TOD zoning. So the, the recommendation report goes into a little bit more detail than some, some other rezonings just because the, the code is new and we're applying it to, to complex problems. So uh, we continue to work with the development team. We think it's a, a great project. Um, you know, there's no glaring issues or anything to report at this time that the proposed TOD 2 MX zoning is appropriate. We do also have a repeal of the ACI um, as part of this request, because of the ACI overlay, the regulations um, are redundant with the TOD uh, zoning that would put in place. Um, oftentimes, the, the TOD even enhances upon certain elements of the ACI requirement. So that's why there is that repeal. So unless you have any questions, staff recommends approval of the rezoning from CC to TOD 2 MX and approval of the repeal of the ACI 2 overlay district. Do we have a motion? to TOD 2 MX and approval of the repeal of the ACI 2 Area of Civic Importance Overlay District. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Okay. Agenda item number 15. Before I get started reading this, um, we are here. We will listen to everybody that wants to come down and speak today. But like I said in the opening remarks, please come down with new information. Try not to repeat what's already been said. And if you can keep your remarks, you know, you know maybe under three minutes, that would be appreciated. But. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started here. Agenda item number 15, case C10-21-35. Applicant, Live 178 LLC, request rezoning from R4 to R7. Property is located within an MCC major commercial corridor overlay district. Location, southeast of 178th and Pacific Streets. And Jim, you're presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, board members, uh, Jim Boozier, 10250 Regency Circle. Um, uh, here on behalf of the applicant, I also have uh, Jeff Lake and Eric Booth uh, here on behalf of the developer as well. And uh, Jeff is uh, going to spend some time talking about some of the uh, project specifics. And also, he's been more actively involved with the neighborhood discussions, which have been numerous. So um, I'm going to after my in introduction of the project, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to go into a few more details. Um, this is uh, an infill uh, project uh, at 178th and Pacific Streets. Uh, just to give a description of, of where we're talking about, so this is 180th and uh, Pacific Street. Uh, the project site's highlighted in, in yellow there. Uh, immediately to the south and on the uh, west, uh, that is, a, uh, uh, that is a daycare facility that's been in existence for a little over a year. And then there's a memory care site that's our neighbor here to the south and to the east. Um, this uh, area here, that's a, a Villas project. Uh, and you're going to hear from uh, the Villas Association. I think that they'll be represented here today. Uh, and then the broader area is the Spring Ridge uh, residential area. And again, I think that, that probably most of the people uh, that are down here to, to talk about the project are from the, from the Spring Ridge area from the, uh, that are residents within that area. And then another key piece of the property here is the, the school, um, which again, you'll hear that one of the main concerns out here is traffic and it's an elementary school. And so at drop off and pick up times, you'll hear that there's a lot of traffic issues out there and, and everybody acknowledges that that's a a problem as it is with many of the school sites that drop off and pick up times uh, around the city. Um, so the specific project um, is a 96 unit apartment complex. The site itself is 4.3 acres. Uh, there's two lots. Um, it's not those uh, the lot uh, divisions aren't shown on the 
on where we have the project sites. Jeff's site plan will uh, give some illustration of that and, and show you where there's a, a couple of easements that run, run through the site that make it a little bit challenging as well. Um, our request today is for a rezoning request uh, to R7 uh, with uh, an MCC major commercial corridor overlay uh, from the existing R4 zoning with uh, MCC overlay. Um, as reflected in the staff report, uh, the areas adjacent to uh, the intersection of 180th and uh, Pacific, uh, there's a 30 acre uh, neighborhood commercial center uh, designation. Um, our property is uh, abutting uh, some existing uh, commercial office uses um, within or adjacent to these 30 acre sites under our uh, master plan there would be permitted up to 350 uh, multifamily uh, units within a quarter mile of, of, that, uh, of that designated area that abuts up against uh, the commercial and office. Um, there is presently no, there are presently no uh, multifamily units uh, constructed within this area. So uh, our 96 acre um, uh, project will uh, be the first multifamily area that abuts this uh, neighborhood uh, district. Um, the R7 zone, um, and I think you'll see that is reflected in the in the staff report, is consistent with the master plan. Um, part of this site, at one uh, one point in time or a couple points in time, uh, did have an R6 uh, designation. Um, Jeff is going to talk about it a little bit, but um, we think we may have a plan that, that may accommodate an R6 zoning. Um, and as I said, when Jeff reviews the site plan and where we started with this and where we're at, you'll get some more uh, flavor of what, what I'm talking about there. Um, the developer has met with, um, I, I guess I would call the uh, key stakeholders in the area, the adjacent neighbors, uh, as I, I discussed, the small miracle daycare. Uh, and the Edgewood Memory Care Facility, which are immediately abut our site. Uh, Jeff has, has visited with the Elkhorn Public Schools Administration, Ryan Lindquist, uh, about our project, um, and they do not have an issue with the project. Uh, and then the Spring Ridge Homeowner Association and Spring Ridge Villas Association. And as I said, Jeff will talk more about that. I did sit in on a couple of the Zoom meetings, one with the Residential Association one with the Homeowner Association. Uh, I've also visited with their counsel, Mike Matukowicz, who you'll hear from. Um, I guess I would commend the boards of those two associations that were participating in those Zoom meetings for the very professional and um, constructive way in which we had our discussions. Um, there's a lot of emotions from the neighbors and residents in the areas over this project, and as you're all aware, um, but I would say that those meetings were conducted very well and, and we had some very good discussions and I think we've been trying to listen to them and respond to their concerns as best we can to, to still move, um, move the project forward. So with that, I'm gonna let Jeff maybe come up and, and talk a little bit more. Jim, about really quick before you go, can, yes. you, can you remind me, the property directly west, that's the commercial office you referenced. The yeah, so this, this property right here, that is all in an MU zoning, and so it's a mix of, of sort of small uh, commercial and, and residential retail type mm -hmm. uh, uses. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Jeff Lake on behalf of the, uh, the ownership group. Uh, and Summit Development address is 21008 Cumberland Drive. Uh, as Jim alluded to, I'm gonna take a little bit of a blow up here and give you a, a little bit of a history of some of the conversations we've had with the uh, abutting uh, properties. As, as Jim mentioned, the daycare, small miracle daycares to the southwest of our site, the um, Edgewood memory cares to the southeast of our site. Uh, knowing there was in early discussions with the planning department, there was no additional accesses off of Poppleton uh, we discovered there was shared access easements uh, via either plats or via recorded documents. We started our first conversations in December with both the daycare and the memory care facility. Um, we, we worked through a few kinks and issues with those. The, I believe the daycare has representation here today. 
uh, to kind of highlight one of the issues that we've discovered from a zoning standpoint that makes our use of their West Drive uh, difficult and an issue for them. Um, I won't go into that since they're here to discuss that. Um, we did uh, reach out to the Association for Spring Ridge. We found that uh, record for that and it had an email address on their website. Uh, we had our first Zoom meeting with them on January 7th. Uh, I think it was a limited board. There's maybe four or five members on that call at that time. Um, we learned at that point that the villas to the east were a different association. Couldn't find records of, of them, so we sent letters out. Uh, researched all the addresses and sent letters out on our own. Uh, we received contact from, from the uh, Villa Association Board. Uh, I think we've had a total of three Zoom meetings uh, since January 7th with the Spring Ridge Association, and we've had two Zoom meetings with the um, Villa Association. Uh, a few other people we contacted, as Jim mentioned, uh, we spoke with the Elkhorn Public Schools. Uh, the response from them is they didn't have any issues with it. Uh, they acknowledged the kind of traffic circulations around the school was problematic, which I think we'll, we'll hear and see some uh, results of that, uh, but said their job wasn't to um, get in the way of development, it was to educate kids. So uh, that, was, that was their stance. Uh, as Jim mentioned, we've had a few evolutions of our, of our plan. Here is, if it'll zoom in there. Thank you very much. Here was the plan that was submitted. Uh, it was a 96 unit um, multifamily. Uh, we, we put in as R7 predominantly because of one zone, zoning regulator, that being floor area ratio. Uh, we met all the other zoning uh, regulations, um, site development regulations with the exception of maybe some setbacks and buffers that we'll talk about. Uh, the product was a three story um, uh, facility. Uh, that was what was submitted upon conversations with the, um, I guess one other point I wanted to, to highlight here, as far as easements, the purplish pinkish colored easements, the, the one on the left or the west is a public storm sewer easement, the one on the right is a public sanitary sewer easement. The yellow access easement on the west side was via plat and dedication. Um, it was referenced on that, it didn't actually get recorded. Uh, so there's some question whether that is a valid easement or not. Uh, and on the east side, there's a recorded document for that easement to indicate access uh, from Poppleton, a shared drive with the memory care. We also have an access drive proposed at 178th Street. So fast forward to the current day plan uh, that we have prepared. Again, this has not been submitted uh, as of yet. We have shared this with both of the HOA boards. We've had conversations about this plan and the changes. I'll highlight a few of those. As, uh, as mentioned, the, the access on the west side that shared with the daycare was, was an issue for them. We have removed that. Uh, we had an issue uh, from hearing from the city on, on front yard in R6 and R7 zoning. You cannot park in the front yard, which is 35 feet. We've removed the parking in that area. Uh, we have consolidated uh, our buildings to be more efficient from four buildings into two buildings. They're still uh, three-story product. They're still 96 units. Uh, the purpose for that was to get our FAR uh, ratios down to meet the R6 regulators. We believe we've accomplished that. Um, and then here is a very early schematic of, of, of the elevations we're looking towards. They're a, a modern uh, look to them, flat roofs, again, three stories. So this is looking from a building, the west building from the south. This is looking from the, I think the left elevation, uh, this from the right elevation, and this from the kind of the Pacific side uh, elevations. Uh, we, have, we have placed these buildings as far away as, as we can from, from the existing facilities. Uh, we have pushed them along Pacific. We have, from the first plan to the second plan, allowed another, I believe, five feet or so on the east side and a little bit more space north of the, the memory care facility. And one other item that we heard from the memory care and from the villas was maybe the concern of the orientation of the clubhouse. Uh, we have turned that 90 degrees. We have placed the pool on the west side. And uh, I believe that's a, kind of a summary of our uh, changes. Uh, we haven't discussed kind of the, the, the product uh, type here. These we, these are market rate uh, units. There's no plan for 
any sort of tax credit. Uh, it's traditional financing, conventional financing is the approach here. Uh, the average rent uh, per unit is $1.30 per square foot. That equates to just under $1,100 a month in rent. Uh, and the range is, depending on the units, we have a mixture of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. Uh, the, the range of total rents are between $800 and $1,600 per month. Um, with that, I think Jim had some, some other comments and closing remarks before we uh, turn it over to, to others to speak. So I, I guess I just wanted to say a couple things in parting. Oh, sorry, Jim Boozier, 10250, reading the circle. I can't believe I forgot that. Uh, <laughs> first time. Uh, so we recognize that there's a great deal of neighborhood opposition. They're going to hear from a lot of neighbors today. Um, and I, I just want to say that, that um, we, we do think that we can make an accommodation uh, to remove uh, the R7 and move to an R6 zoning. Um, we think that, that uh, under the R7 zoning, the maximum density is like 197 units. Um, and under the R6 zoning, the maximum is 98, so we're still under the R6 zoning. We think we can comply with those regulators uh, with, our new, with our new layout. Um, we, we do commit further to working with the Villas Association, Homeowners Association, as we continue to have our site plan evolved, as we continue to evolve our elevations, as we continue to evolve the programming for the project. So the dog parks and the uh, all the other facilities and amenities with the structure, the landscaping plan, the lighting. Uh, you know, we've been involved in other apartment projects with this developer before, and so we've, we've heard some of these issues before on infill projects, and so we know the sensitivity to those issues, and I can tell you that this developer in particular is, is very good at working with the neighborhood group, and um, I hope that, that the neighbors, the associations that do are represented here today will recognized by the discussions that we've had that, that that's a sincere um, offer from our from our team. Um, so we do ask that, that, that the board uh, do approve our project today. Um, we do believe we have a, a positive recommendation, a, a favorable recommendation from the planning department, and we think it is a good project and suitable for the area and, and is master plan compliant. So thank you, and I'm sure there'll be some questions as we move through the process, and, and Jeff and I'll trying to answer those as they come up. Thank Jim, you. Jim, I have a request. Could you leave up the aerial up there for people that are coming up? If, you know, sometimes they point out addresses, it's hard to, to know where people are Would you like to see this from. as it's a one Yeah, year. just leave that up there, and if somebody wants to remove it and show something else, they can do that, but they can at least reference that. Thank you. You bet, Eric. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you're still asking for the R7 zoning, correct? But you're saying that you think you could make it work. I just want to make sure that I understand. I, I think that I, um, I guess I want to defer to Jeff, but I think we could we could probably make the R6 zoning work, and I think that if it came down to that, and that the, the neighborhood thought that that was a, a benefit to their acceptance of the project, and a more, uh, I don't think they're ever going to accept it necessarily, but if that's viewed as favorable from the neighborhood, I think we'd be willing to move in that direction. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Good afternoon, Mark Sanford, architect for the uh, Small Miracle Daycare. I'm here as representative uh, for Rick Burkholz. I'm at 1306 North 162nd Street. Thank you. I was the architect for the Small Miracle Project, and uh, at the time when we developed the project, we uh, had to uh, purchase some land just east of the uh, building itself to uh, meet our impervious coverage. So we need to keep that area as impervious and didn't want the paving or another drive along there. Uh, with that being said and seeing the new, the new plan that uh, they have generated, Mr. Brokholz is in support of the project. And I just wanted to bring that to light, why we don't want the paving. and it's, uh, We are in favor of that. Of course, an apartment building is much more desirable than a drive-in or some other business that might be in there and multiple businesses, and uh, being under one management, the area will be under control and kept clean and, and nice and proper. They've got two accesses along the east 
and also along the west, so uh, Mr. Burkholz did not feel that they needed the access through his property. And as I'm in support, okay. one you, of Mark. the few people. <laughs> Thank you. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? How many opponents are going to speak today? Okay. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Matukowitz. I'm here today with Hattie Miller, 8701 West Dodge Road, Suite 408, Omaha, Nebraska, 68114. We're with the firm of Lycus and Matukowitz, and we represent the Spring Ridge Villas Homeowners Association and the Spring Ridge Homeowners Association, which, as uh, Jim mentioned, are located to the east primarily and the uh, east and surrounding the community here. Hattie Miller with me today is going to present to you, there's a, been a petition that's been generated throughout the neighborhood with 396 signatures opposing the plan. It also contains a summary of my presentation as well as the PowerPoint presentation here, which we'd like to be made part of the public record. As I mentioned, I represent the, these two associations. Spring Ridge has 15 villas, and the villas, excuse me, are located Little technology issue here. All right, so this, the villas are located right here, where I'm moving the mouse. The site again is right here. We have the daycare, the memory facility, and again, that vacant site here is what we're talking about. I'm going to speak to you from a macro perspective and request denial of the of the rezoning application. From a subjective standpoint, it is not consistent with the master plan. It does not carry out its goals and objectives. It would adversely affect the neighborhood. And it would do so by uh, not allowing the appropriate use of land. It will cause congestion in an already congested neighborhood. It will endanger public safety. We have actually two schools. Uh, Jim had mentioned one of the schools. There's also an elementary school, which is right behind us. And then there's a middle school north of 180th and Pacific. The plan also causes undue concentration of people, strains transportation, could strain our stormwater and sewer systems and reduce the values of close by neighboring properties. The proposed use also, as noted in the recommendation from the planning department, currently does not comply with site development, landscaping, and parking requirements of the zoning ordinance. Now back to our plan here, I think when the planning department looks at it, they look at it from the, the close perspective. I wanna point out a couple other sites here. North of Pacific on 180th, where I'm moving the mouse, you'll see we have a high V, a lot of traffic generated there. We have already mentioned the memory care facility and then the daycare right here. North of Pacific, we have another daycare and a bar. We have up here where you see the football field, we have the middle school, and the middle school, I believe, has uh, 508 students. We have the grade school down below our site here. Here's the grade school, here's the south. So the grade school down here, that has 540 students, which I'll show you an excerpt from the school's website showing that they're at or maybe over capacity currently. So those are some additional site features. Right here, the large commercial strip mall that was mentioned also features the Good Life Bar. Uh, frankly, it's a unique bar that has patrons ranging from 21 to probably 81. It gets a lot of traffic. We have various bars and restaurants in this district. We have bars and restaurants across the street to the north as well. And with respect to this plan not being consistent with the master plan, the future land use map shows this to be a low residential zoning area into the future. So here's the current map. You'll see the site where it says R4 MCC in here, and here's the site we're talking about. It's shown on the future land use for the city of Omaha as being R4 low density residential. Here's another excerpt from the map. The site is here in purple, and it is shown on the future master plan to be low density residential. Now, with respect to the plan, for more than approximately 20 years, this has been zoned R4. And in fact, in April or May of 2011, 
There was an application, I believe, by Noddle Company before this very board trying to change the zoning to a greater density, either R6 or R7, to place apartments there. That was actually voted down and did not move forward. So since that time, these neighboring homeowners have relied upon, and frankly have had a right to rely since it was denied, that this would remain low density residential zoning. The, the developer, I, I do commend them, as Jim mentioned and as Jeff Lake mentioned, have been very open and willing to discuss with us. And I'd also commend the planning department. Eric has been very open and willing to discuss the owner's concerns. But nonetheless, they've set forth no real justification why we need a high density 96 residential unit apartment in this area. The homeowner should be able to rely on the past, present, and future master plan. With respect to this, we believe that the plan would adversely affect the neighborhood. There has been no formal traffic study done of this area, and residents report waiting three to five light cycles, whether you're going west on Pacific through 180th or going south on uh, 180th through the 180th and Pacific Street intersection. Three to five light cycles, 20 to 30 minute wait in peak times, the mornings and the afternoons. And I'll show you a quick video here in a moment of some of that congestion. The, uh, as I mentioned, it's very congested in this area. We have uses that are that uh, warrant the high congestion, the high V, Elkhorn Ridge Middle School. I mentioned 508 students go to that school. Spring Ridge Elementary School with 540 students at that school. Two daycares, memory care center with the two strip malls and numerous bars and restaurants. Now the na nearest major thoroughfare at this time, which is 168th Street, is currently going, uh, being widened. So that's going to be under construction for at least a year, if not multiple years, which c creates additional congestion here. On 180th Street, there is no right turn lane. If I can go to, am I able to switch between? I can just go back, that's fine. So as you come out of these apartments, well, this will show it right here. As you come out right here, there is no right turn lane. So you could either go left or straight across into High V, that plaza area here. There's no right turn lane here although we have the school back south of us with which the traffic backs up considerably. Yeah, I'm not following you there, Mike. So there's not a separate right turn lane. So people who are trying to turn right here, okay. they end up waiting. If you're trying to cross traffic, they're holding it up. They, there should be another lane here to allow that. And again, there, there hasn't been a study to show. Now I have talked to Eric Haas, by the way, from uh, Public Works about this, and he said normally, you would do a study when there's more features that we could put in. Other than that right turn lane, I'll admit there probably aren't a lot of new features you can put in, which only goes to the point that this is probably maxed as far as what traffic it can handle right now. The only thing that can solve this is by widening Pacific and 180th and in visiting with the city, I haven't received a timeline as to when that's gonna happen. So again, someday in the future, that could be something that would assist this, but right now, we don't know when 180th or Pacific Street will be widened. Uh, as I mentioned, the widening, there's been also no study of the public safety impact. So you have uh, over a thousand elementary school walking kids walking in this area. I wish we could say they walk on sidewalks all the time and stick to them, but they don't. So we have a lot of kids, a lot of traffic walking in here. And there's been no study to date regarding the in existing infrastructure and the impact that this development would have on that, have on that meaning wastewater and sewer. Now I mentioned a moment ago on the Spring Ridge Elementary site, it basically says in an effort to reduce overcrowding, Spring Ridge is asking and reassigning students in surrounding neighborhoods to other schools right now. So that tends to lead us to believe that we're at or near capacity at Spring Ridge Elementary right now. And based upon the traffic, it sure seems that way. Here's the traffic flow for Spring Ridge Elementary traffic. It comes off of uh, Pacific, you'll see on the north, up at the top here. They come in, they turn in front of the daycare they go down this residential street here, 177th Street, and then they'll go up Shadow Ridge, back over by the school, and drop off in this area. So we have kind of a rectangular traffic plan going back out and some going out on Shadow Ridge Drive. So uh, the video I'm gonna show you here shows the traffic on 177th Street, which is this street, on an average morning. We'll show you two different mornings, one uh, on the 27th and one on the 28th of last week. So this shows an average morning at the school drop, drop off. This is January 27th at 8.09 a.m. So we kind of have almost a parking lot situation of cars backed up. 
So all these people that need to get in and out to go to work as well uh, face this every day. And this is without the additional 96 units that are, are planned here. So I'll move forward. The next one is the same showing the next day. And the reason I want to show this, what happens frequently is you have people who don't want to be in the school line and jump the line, or even people who are in the school line jumping the line. You'll see a white Range Rover come dashing to the left and kind of boycotting and going around the traffic here, which again creates a, can create a dangerous situation. There we go. So again, this is one of our residential streets right adjacent to where these apartments are going to be and what it looks like right now. Now, as noted in the plan, or in the recommendation, excuse me, from the city planning department, the units, or the plan, does not comply with existing requirements. We have 96 units on about 4.53 acres currently. The max capacity, according to, to suburban developers, again, you might do something different downtown, but if you're talking about a suburban development with above ground parking, it, you're going to generally get about 21.2 units as a rule of thumb on that. So right here, we're maxed to that general rule of thumb for suburban development with this particular development. There has not been a full zoning uh, review performed, which is noted in the recommendation from the planning department. And the report does note deficiencies with the proposed layout and applicable zoning regulations, including multiple areas where the required buffer zone has not been provided. I believe this under R7 would require a 30-foot bu buffer zone between the development and the villas, which again are located to the east. There's been no invest investigation or study, which I've already mentioned, regarding the increase in stormwater management, stormwater runoff, runoff treatment, or the effect on the existing sanitary sewer system in this area based upon 96 new units going in. Lastly, I'd say the plan is incomplete. I think we're just premature to be here today because uh, Mr. Lake has been very open with us and did share with us the new plan going from four buildings to two. And again, we commend him and all the communication, which has been excellent. We still have the two buildings. Uh, that had just changed within the last couple days. Um, I think the plan is still in the works, is why I say it's premature. It does not include any de design details which the neighborhood could even rely upon, such as what will be in the buffer zones? What type of landscaping are we going to use? What are we going to use for the architectural design, the garages, and the clubhouse? We don't know what additional facilities. It looks like there'll be a pool, and, and Jeff mentioned that, uh, but we don't know if there'll be a fire pit, other features. Uh, that remains to be seen. Lastly, there's no details regarding site and noise breaks, and again, that's going to apply most to those villas, which we need to know what's gonna be the breaker there in that 30-foot buffer zone. And there's really no location details of landscaping. For instance, are we gonna, going to get brand new trees or can we ask for 15 foot trees? Those kinds of things. So the plan remains in the works. We, we do request that the board deny this application on the grounds indicated. I think we're just early in the planning here. We don't have enough information. We have a congestion issue already, which 96 apartments are going to exacerbate. And, um, and we, again, although we commend the developer for the communication, it's just not something that the neighborhood supports. And in fact, we request that you decline it. Thank you. Michael, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. And I apologize that this was already covered. If you're standing on Poppleton at the daycare and you're looking east, I'm sorry, south, what's, what, is there any kind of barrier for those homes there? Is there like a fence or a retaining wall? Is, so if you're at the, the daycare and you're looking south. So Poppleton and then yeah. the daycare here. Well, you just, are you just looking into those homes, the, the yards of those homes? I believe there's only some tree break there. I don't believe there's any fencing. Okay. Nothing there, so just fencing right there. Or no there, fencing, I'm sorry, nothing there, nothing there. Thank you. And Mike, can you point to where that video was taken on the map? 177th Street right here. So it'd be one of these homes right in here. In which direction was, was, the, was the traffic flowing? Right here? Okay. I can tell you it's uh, Nancy Peters. Two houses south? Okay, it's uh, right here? All right. And it's Nancy Peters' home is, is who it is. You have a letter from Nancy Peters in the record, I believe. So, that, yeah, that's where the video was taken. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other opponents wishing to speak?
Good afternoon. Tony McLaughlin, 17411 Poppleton Avenue, Omaha 68130. I'm here uh, representing the Spring Ridge Homeowners Association Board of Directors. Uh, we represent 298 homes. Uh, you saw some, from some earlier images here. There are quite a few. I don't know if I, how I get that, this particular machine on to show you. This is a very dense residential area. If I could flip this over north of Pacific, you'd see the same thing north of Pacific. This is, I've lived in this area. My house is probably right about there. Lived here for about 18 years uh, and watched this area develop. So we're, we're not here to be pro or anti-development. Uh, Jeff, Jeff's been great to work with. We're just anti this project. It doesn't fit. It's, it's, you heard, I think, even from them, they're trying to squeeze everything in at the maximum possible way. They're willing to go from seven to six to squeeze this in. And that doesn't fit with, with, the, with the community. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the area, but it's, there's not a two-story structure within, I think the one that was just developed at a northwest corner of 168th in Pacific, there is a Methodist hospital office building that went in there. The next closest apartments really are, are up on Dodge on 180th Street. Uh, there's a new development out uh, west about a mile uh, on Pacific. So it's a, it is truly a very congested area. And if, even if, I, if it's appropriate for me to ask those here in opposition, I can ask you how many times going north on 178th Street you approach that light. There's an island you can see there in, in, the, in the middle which restricts uh, your sight. It backs up clear down past Poppleton uh, in the afternoon when all that afternoon traffic is, is heading to the middle. Many of them are heading to the middle school trying to turn left on Pacific at that time of day. And it's not just peak times. I know Jeff mentioned that we had some peak time issues. It, it can happen any time of the day. Uh, I, I would guess I'd ask the people here, how many of you have sat through at least two to three light, light cycles at 178th and Pacific? How many have sat through at least two to three light cycles going west on Pacific at 180th? How many have sat through six light cycles going north on 180th and when you hit Pacific? Yes, sir. Okay. That wasn't there 18 years ago. But the development is fine. We support the city. We want to be good neighbors. Uh, it's just everything you've heard, I think, even from them, they're just trying to, this is not the right project for this specifically, specific parcel of the land. Uh, that, that is our position. I don't want to echo more. You've asked me to be respectful of time and, and not to uh, reiterate some of the other. I, I, everything he said is absolutely spot on. Uh, we just think, it, let's, why not take a step back? And let's really make sure we make an informed decision rather than rushing forward, moving from an R4 to an R6 or R7. I'm an ignorant person to your jobs. Thank you for listening. But that seems like a big leap to me. And it just, it reminds me of driving down some of these older, beautiful neighborhoods we have in our city. And, and you see that one lot that somebody buys and says, man, I love that lot. It's one I'd like to have. They raise that property and they put up this brand new contemporary home. And you drive through that area and you see it and it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I would, I would suggest to you that's exactly what's gonna happen here, a new contemporary design. 96 units is 96 units, whether it's two buildings, three buildings, 10 buildings. Uh, he, he's redrawn some plans. Our concern is 96 units, that's a big number. Our concern is 192 parking stalls. That's all additional traffic to, that isn't this, that, that's a regular occurrence every single day and not just, on school days, absolutely on 177th, but in that area, and, and I've been in the city for 30 plus years, this is as congested of an area. The city really needs to take a look at what it's gonna do at 180th Pacific. And a right-hand turn lane, I'd even suggest coming out of 178th, would help alleviate some of that congestion that backs up south of Pacific, north of 178th, and the natural flow from the uh, middle, uh, the elementary school to the middle school. So with that, I, I just ask for your consideration and your no vote in opposition of this uh, proposed plan. Tony, I have a couple questions for you. Sure. So I'm very familiar with the area. I live in the general vicinity, so I'm very familiar with the area. Um, nice piece of property this is. Mm -hmm. So if it's not this, what would it be uh, in, your, in your eyes? What would you like it to great be? Great question. Uh, it, it was owned by a church. I think it's mm -hmm. changed hands a couple of times. We were very happy with that. You know, people that come in occasionally, uh, big traffic on Sunday, but it doesn't conflict with school traffic. Uh, we thought that would be a perfect neighbor for this type of uh, of land. It, it would fit within the current zoning, so we aren't here trying to push something forward, advance it, create more density. We would be simply complying with what the overlay already is and what the zoning requirement is currently. It, something similar, I, we even discussed on the way down, uh, you know, the church was there. Uh, any, even if it was a strip mall, 
I don't know, I, I have a personal opinion. I think that would even bring less traffic uh, than 96 unit apartment units with almost 200 parking stalls. It depends upon what's in there, right? Depends what's in there, absolutely. Yeah, so you got a major grocery store across the street. You got a strip center already on the corner of 180th yep. there. Um, I don't know that more commercial would uh, be the right answer, but maybe, I don't know, it depends upon what's in there. Um, but I do agree with you with the, with the respect that that area is very congested. Um, it always has been in 180th Street. It's probably not going to be improved for some period of time, although it needs to be. Um, 96 unit apartments will come and go various times of the day. And I do know that school traffic is always a problem throughout the city. Right, I can drive across the city of Omaha anywhere during school times, and it's just it's just a problem, and, and get that. But I look at the school layout and the way that their 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 layout is, and it's 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 not the most conducive for bringing in traffic and, and exiting traffic. Uh, it's just not. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things, and it is a very dense area yep. uh, on both sides of Pacific Street there. But uh, I was just curious what you thought might be the best use of that property if it wasn't this. Um, so. De Great question, uh, and we work with any deve potential developer. Like I said, we're not anti-development. We know someday something's going to go in there. Uh, it's just the, this, in our opinion, a three-story, 96-unit apartment complex, no matter how many buildings, no matter how they chop it up and, and move the pieces around, is still 96 units with an already, and you said yourself, a very congested area. So to congest it furthermore, and probably the most congested area, is right where they're going to take that uh, egress right there right across where the island is south there 170 that's right where everything most of your traffic coming there coming or going are people going to access it from Pacific they're not going to turn south on 178th and turn into their apartment complex or they're going to come out of their apartment complex and go north on 178th once they get used to the backlog they'll start taking Poppleton and shooting through the neighborhood like people I, somebody earlier today said I, I know the area the guy from South Omaha you, you find the residential streets that get you through that avoid the lights and avoid the congestion and that's another fear is, is Poppleton is already a very busy street. It's got two ste speed bumps on it. And uh, there, there's, we've got people that don't go the speed limit all the time. So that, that's always a concern as well. And safety, safety is, is truly a legitimate concern of ours. There was a lot of kids walking in this area, uh, including mine when they went to both of these schools. And uh, they don't stay on sidewalks and they can pop out. And you see some of the cars going by on the videos. No, some aren't going 25. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Um, before we move any further, uh, Michael and Tony addressed a lot of issues here. So if you want to come up, we'll, we're here to listen. But they've addressed, uh, your attorney did a very good job and addressed a lot of issues. If you've got new information, you know, please come forward. We're here to listen to you. And uh, just come forward, give your name and address if you wish to speak. Good afternoon. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, Jed Snar, S N A R R, at 17607 Poppleton Avenue. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to participate in the uh, function that I've dedicated my life to protect and defend as a member of the uh, uh, military. Uh, we moved here in 2017 uh, from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I had a 45 minute commute over four miles because of traffic and moved here. Uh, my coworkers joke that I list, live in East Denver because my commute is 30 minutes to the base. I said, it's not East Denver. It's a wonderful, uh, pleasant neighborhood to live in. And now that I'm up for reassignment uh, in docking with uh, real estate professionals about our home and the sale of our home, given the proposed development, because uh, I live right across the street from the assisted uh, memory facility. And they're projecting already uh, between five and eight depreciation, percent depreciation in the, in the potential sale of uh, our home. And certainly, uh, you know, there's no expectation that we're supposed to profit from the sale of our home. But if given the opportunity to voice opposition for this uh, project, I would certainly like to be able to do so. Um, I'm just a small country boy from Missouri, a town of 600 folks, and it sort of feels by the conversation 
that this may be already a done deal and we're just kind of going around what it may be zoned at. And it's unfortunate that we have a room full of uh, neighbors here who feel against uh, or in opposition to this particular type of development in this area, but yet it may be all for naught. And so again, I would just like to be on the public record as expressing uh, opposition to this particular type of development and uh, thank the board for their time. Thank you, Judd. I'm gonna head to San Antonio here pretty soon, so. <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? Uh, Danielle Campbell, 17617 Poppleton. So my home is right here, um, across from Edgewood Memory Care. And I bought my home with my husband in August of 2019 for $382,000. Um, our home was previously owned by a real estate agent and she has now projected the value of our home to go down about $50,000 with this project. Um, I have a whole statement for you, I won't read it because most of it has already been said, but uh, I have two small children, uh, three and five years old. The balconies from this apartment will be directly into our home's windows, and that is a big concern for us. Uh, the value of our home, the traffic, like everyone said, we sit in our driveway for three to five minutes every morning, uh, just waiting to get out to go to daycare, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Anyone else? Okay, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Paul McGuerra, and uh, I live on 1736 South 179th Avenue, which is uh, over here on the south side of Spring Ridge School, about a block south. Um, I, uh, I will be brief, and I just wanted to add some additional information uh, regarding what's going on with respect to traffic in that area. So happens that I do work for hy -Vee not for this store, but uh, for one of the other stores in the area. Um, I don't know all that goes on at uh, the Pacific Springs store, but uh, I am pretty familiar with uh, what, uh, what the future holds for them. And uh, suffice to say that the uh, Pacific Springs Hy-Vee is one of the fastest growing stores in the Omaha region. And that means that traffic is going to continue to increase uh, the sales volume, which can also be measured by the customer traffic going through that store, has grown by about 20% in the last two years. Now, the other factor that uh, wasn't talked about with the traffic study is over here. Um, sorry, my finger's kind of blotting it out a little bit, but uh, some of you may have noticed what we call the port of entry, which is the facility that uh, they built for online shopping. And there's a reason for that. Um, online shopping orders now at a store like Pacific Street average as many as 100, 500 a day. And if you think that's not gonna grow, go into a, one of our stores and see what's going on with online shopping. So conceivably, you're gonna see more than that here in the future. And a lot of that traffic comes through during rush hour, because that's when people are getting off of work. So. Uh, I just wanted to add that information in case uh, um, you needed any more information regarding traffic flows and what's going on there. I'd be very supportive of any project that, you know, we do look at the impact on traffic and that uh, uh, I, myself, as other residents in the area have also experienced what happens when there's congestion and it is bad uh, without, you know, to say the least. So again, thank you for allowing me to speak. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Patricia Hayes at 1742 South 177th Avenue. And um, I'm just bringing up, the only thing that's different about what I'm bringing up is that it's from a neighboring HOA, um, Pacific Springs, which is directly to the north. Um, and he wanted a letter submitted from him in opposition of the development. And the only thing that I would say is somewhat different than what's been talked about already is that this sets a precedent that um, 
apartments being this close to a school building in the Elkhorn School District, according to what he has seen. It's not an official study or anything like that. But he did a simple study, and that's what he um, came up with, is that there are no apartments as close to um, other schools in the Elkhorn District. Okay. Thank you. Good. Anyone else wishing to speak? Good afternoon. My name is Jane Slowa, and I am a resident of Spring Ridge. It's Jane, S-L-O-B-O-T-H, 1330 South 177 Street. Just a couple things I'm going to address that people have brought up, and then I have a couple things that I may or may not read. Another opportunity for this blank lot on Francis Street, across from the, um, down on about Francis, it's by the, the down by a lake, it's not far. They built some villas a couple years ago. They were gonna be $400,000. These lots, they were, who in their right, on a busy land, sold like that. Every one of them sold before they were built. We would love to have some villas. How about some villas for 55 and plus? Oh, that'd be awesome. That's one thing. To avoid the traffic. Cut through the subdivisions. That's how you avoid that rear end accident I was in. Cut through down 177th Street. Cut down Poppleton. Don't take Pacific. Don't take Center. Don't take 180th. Cut through Pacific Springs. Cut through Spring Ridge. That's my thought there. Creates a lot more traffic. The memory care breaks my heart. They are against this. It breaks my heart. How can you have trash trucks emptying their trash at 3 o'clock in the morning and these residents hearing this noise? The light pollution, the noise pollution, maybe a wall going up so the, the apartments aren't in their view. These poor people need to be given this grace. The school. There was a posting in the next door. Now, my children do not attend Spring Ridge, but they are registering right now for Spring Ridge Elementary. And when they are going on, for example, Rose Garden Estates, the Ridges, Pacific Springs, all outer line from Spring Ridge, those that are new families are getting a note, a return note that says, if you are a new family, and you are residing in XYZ, Pacific Springs, the Ridges, there are many, many areas. To avoid overcrowding, Spring Ridge may be asking you to go to a different school. So if the Ridges, and you just bought a home there, and you're hoping to have your child walk to Spring Ridge, we don't have room at the school anymore. We're going to have to have you go to Fire Ridge or some of the other neighboring schools. But I don't have children there. So um, the homes on Poppleton. 178th is the absolute only street out of that entire area that gets out on Pacific Street. From Banyan, from the villas, from everywhere. You have to go up that 178th street. So I got to send my 17-year-old up up the street, and it's uphill, and downhill it is a fun zoom down. You've got that land. If someone is turning in, I'm sorry my little 90-year-old lady who is now living by alone on herself, by herself, giving her the safety. We have a lot of senior citizens, cutest little senior citizens you've ever seen in our neighborhood. 90, they're 80, I hope they talk, people talk like me about that. Um, anyway, so, a senior citizen is going up that street, and here is this, this land of, of bushes, and, and the residents need to cross over 178th Street, and it is crowded. And they turn, and we all try and make our best judgments. Well, we don't always, we don't always have luck on that. And if we've got a lot of things coming at us, and there's the sweet little old lady or, or the sweet little 56-year-old coming down the street, you know, so busy, um, and it's an awful accident, but it's going to happen. So I was boots on the ground. You and we have a wonderful HOA that has done an awesome deal. We have awesome boots on the ground. I am not a business writer or anything. My partner in crime is Nancy Peters. She's the brains of the boots on the ground. Yesterday, she had to have a, an emergency appendix taken out. 
So here I am. You, you get what you get. So she has written a late letter. Now, she just got home yesterday from her appendix. She wrote her letter, submitted her letter. She's an amazing, talented person that wrote this letter in regards to traffic. I don't know if you have had the opportunity to see it because she was not able to send it until noon. May I read it or would you prefer me not to? How long, how long is it? She has pictures. Um, <laughs> two pages. I can read fast, you can okay. stop me. Go ahead. Okay, you can stop me anytime, right. just throw up a, all right, okay. Um, this is on behalf of Nancy Peters. Sweet little thing. This is written in objection to the proposed rezoning of the lot at 178th and Pacific. Although there are a number of reasons for objecting, I am writing this to emphasize one particular reason, and that is the traffic around Spring Ridge School. During school drop-off times, the, the traffic is so very congested and backed up that it creates a safety hazard for blocks. This is not a situation that is unique to wintertime or any other time of year. It has been going on for years. It is even more acute in non-pandemic times. In fact, I wrote to the city planner in 2013 about the traffic heart hazards in this very area. And you have, with all the, the packets that you received, another letter that I'll get to that she was referring to when she wrote in 2013. To illustrate, the map shows our home on 1420 South 177th Street in reference to Spring Ridge Elementary. So that is about right there, backs up to the common area right about there. So she is the one that submitted that video that you saw earlier. During school drop-off times, the traffic backs up as illustrated by the yellow line all the way to Poppleton Street where the developer proposes having the entrance exit the apartment complex traffic. This area is heavily congested with um, only vehicular traffic, more significantly pedestrian traffic of children walking to Spring Ridge and nearby Elkhorn Ridge Elementary. I chose this photo because it is unusual or a rare depiction, but quite opposite. I could take a photo like this nearly every morning. In fact, I changed the schedule for when I leave in the morning so I can safely get out of our driveway. But the blocking of the driveway is the least of traffic hazards. It is not uncommon for drop-off uh, traffic to treat 177th Street a two-way street as one-way southbound street, driving southbound in both southbound and northbound lanes. I must emphasize, this is neither new nor a rare occurrence. The first time I encountered a southbound vehicle in the northbound lanes, I was taking my own children to school several years ago. As I neared Poppleton on 177th Street, I came face to face with an enormously large SUV driven by a person who was furious to encounter me, as if I were in their normal lane. The next time it happened, I found myself face to face with a sanitation truck trying to jump the lane. The next time it happened, I found myself face to face or, or in Spring Ridge drop-off line. Those first encounters were more than five years ago. And with the increased traffic, the frequency of the, of the line jumpers has only increased over time. On January 27th and 28th, 2021, uh, after I learned of the developer's attempt to rezone the lots, I went outside to video normal Spring Ridge drop-off time. So you've seen that. Um, it is important to add that it ha as, as hazardous as it is for vehicles on 177th Street during school drop-off, it is far more hazardous for students trying to walk to school. The students are left to dodge the double traffic lanes of traffic. We have to hope that they look to opposite direction before they stepping into the street um, in front of the uh, wrong way line jumpers. The traffic hazards increase even further at the intersections as cars jockey for position. There is a young man who lives east of 177th Street who I would nearly see nearly every uh, day taking his bike to Spring Ridge School, except he didn't ride it. He could only walk it because of all the traffic. Every single day, this young man would have to walk his bike because the traffic was so thick and hazardous. The planning committee and city council cannot possibly intend to increase the hazards. They are certainly on notice of the existence of the safety hazard to both vehicles and pedestrians. In conclusion, for a number of reasons, I object to the proposed rezoning of the lot at 178th and Poppleton. The most significant reason is the traffic and pedestrian hazard which already exists and which will be compounded by the addition of an apartment complex. There are serious liability issues already in existence and will be increased by following traffic in the area. She has submitted this letter to all of you, I'm sure. 
Um, I have one because I back up to the common area, and I don't feel that the drainage has particularly been dressed enough. May I read that as well? Yeah. I, okay. No one's talked about the drainage. So okay. All right. So I'm good. Spring Ridge is on the down. So I live at 1330 South 177th Street. So I am the third house from Poppleton that backs up to the common area. So Spring Ridge has been given a name Spring. Guess why? There's springs. They couldn't build on the common area. Why? Because it's too much water. OK, here we go. Spring Ridge is on the downhill slope from the 180th and Pacific. Water naturally flows our way, uh, although in the past there was a natural vegetation and soil to absorb the water. As development has taken place to the north of Spring Ridge, the overflow of rainwater and natural runoff from the north has resulted in continually increased flooding and water overflow of the yards and common ground and around our house. When High V was built at 180th and Pacific, and again, when the child care center was built on 178th and Poppleton, the drainage issues in the common ground became more acute as the natural vegetation to the north was replaced with pavement. The yards in the common ground flood more readily, more severely, and the trash from the sewers accumulates on the common ground. I understand the design is for floodwaters. In the common ground is to reach our yards in only the most heavy of rains. Those rains we were to get six to seven inches at a time. In fact, even with moderate rain, the rain has come into our yards in recent years. But we cannot do anything about the fact that the in infrastructure, which was put in place for drainage when the subdivision was originally formed, did not take into consideration the heavy toll from the surface waters resulting from the development of the north. The lot at issue, which the developer seeks to rezone, is now nearly all natural vegetation. The developer's plans for the apartment complex show pavement of nearly the entire surface. Combined with the runoff from the, from the roof surfaces, this will result in further draining and flooding issues on the south side of Poppleton. Moreover, the developer's plans lack any evidence of plans for a siltation pond. While as owners, homeowners, we appreciate that Hy-Vee and the Child Care Center were appropriate development, it cannot be ignored that the current infrastructure is not adequate for drainage and storm runoff without causing significant damage to the homes and property south of Poppleton. And, <sighs> and the last thing, you guys get to read the story to yourself. It has been um, submitted to you along with the petitions. Um, and this is from the 177th Street neighbors. I really encourage you to read this because it goes back 20 some years. It's a little history story about how it is said from Mr. England um, the planning department recommendation report provided by the Omaha City Planner, which states, future land use plan designation, colon, low density residential. On a final note, the properties that align Poppleton, which is, across, which is at the corner of 178th, so you go down 178th and you turn left. On your right-hand side is a wonderful couple, retirement home, just bought it in June. Behind them at 177th Street, unfortunately Gwen is not here to speak, but 177th and Poppleton, she, she's sick about it. In November, November, they just spent their retirement, bought their retirement home. They are not able to move again. Across some, the street is Danielle, and up that Poppleton Street is Jed, which is going to be moving with the military. So just three houses with, um, are new within a year and a half. Two, retirement within the last six months. So that would be devastating um, if that took place. So those are my little things. And um, thank you very much. And thank you for accepting all of our letters and our petitions and our calls. And we really appreciate all that you are listening to and doing for us. And, and so we oppose. Thank you very much. Uh, You've got someone else who can speak. Yeah, we've got others that, oh, that want to speak, so. Okay. Colton Heller, 1307 South 175th Avenue. Colton Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R. Um, I am on the board for the HOA for Spring Ridge, along with Tony and a few others that are here. And just to comment on that water drain off, 
This is a common area owned by the Spring Ridge Homeowners Association that we pay dues for to maintain. Um, today, as it stands, we currently um, are filling sinkholes in that area, and it poses a liability um, to the safety of our residents um, just as the water comes off and runs that out. In addition to that, um, we already are having comment, uh, sorry, we are already discussing what we need to do in terms of erosion as a result of the creek that runs through there if this happens. So we've already got erosion issues encroaching on lot lines today that we're talking about how we can adjust that and figure out ways if it's retaining walls or in putting in more rock or whatever we need to put in to prevent erosion towards our, our lot lines there. And then the last thing that I would comment on is about the first 20 or 30 yards here um, the, is actually not really treed. There's a canopy, but it's open in the middle. And I guess my concern would be um, pet relief um, if, if all the residents there are taking their pets over there and utilizing the common area that we maintain with our homeowners association dues um, for their pets. So that would be my main thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colton. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, thank you, Colton. Yeah. Hi there, Chelsea Carlgard, 1338 South 170th Street, Omaha. Is there any way I can get this one up? Yeah. Yeah, can you get that? Which one? Is this one? Oh, I thought there's a. Oh. Or can you get the one that's a little more narrowed in? Oh, I guess. You can do that if she is. Perfect. That okay. one? Yeah, yeah. If you want to go south. Let's see. Um, if you want to go. This will work okay. because I think there's. A curb cut that comes out of the good life and the imagination station is there and so I think something that oh sure okay so right here okay so imagination station is a daycare which is right here okay when you this is the good life everyone's familiar with the good life when you come out here on 178th mm -hmm. they're proposing having a curb cut right behind the daycare this is going to be such a pain point with these people and these people trying to enter the, all this school traffic. And I heard you say, well, it's school traffic. I don't think until you come there and actually see it to see how much of a pain point and safety concern it is. So all that I ask the board, I understand you're in a difficult position, is that you make a data-driven based decision to come to your decision with the traffic and really see it out full spectrum. Um, I did not plan to speak. I hate public speaking, and I don't even know if, yeah, you can't. But I have video of how the traffic becomes. OK, so this would be this intersection on 177th right here. We there is a stop sign right here. You can't here. see where you're pointing to move your oh. point. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. There you go. OK, so oh. this is, oh, stay, on that. stay on this one? Yeah. OK. This here is there you go. okay. This intersection right here. Where, okay. You, <laughs> oh, on the I'm map. sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. One Chelsea. moment. <laughs> okay. 177. I know. I'm trying to right here. Okay. So right. there's a stop sign right there, and it is for the people that are traveling south. Okay. That's how school traffic comes in. They're supposed to stop there. What happens is you get two lanes of traffic. You get the carpool line that's backed up, and the people are trying to go to work. No one stops at the stop sign, for one thing. And all of a sudden, you have no one that can head north on 177th because you have no one wants to follow rules, first of all. And there's just there's not enough space for everyone. So this is just one pain point within the commute. Um, the daycare, I think most of the parents, they would be appalled if they knew the daycare provider was for it because watching the daycare cross the children from Poppleton onto 178th in the morning is frightening because there's no call to traffic to stop there to make that cross. So all that I ask is that you make a data-driven based decision. And right now you can't get accurate data on the traffic count. With COVID, we have 37 to 52 families that are out with remote learning. That does not include the families that are in quarantine. That only includes the families that are participating in remote learning. So our traffic count is down. So anything that would be submitted to you for traffic right now, I would really say is not an accurate depiction of what it truly is. So please make a data-based informed decision, not just it's school traffic. That's all that I ask. 
question. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Anyone else wishing to speak? Can I make one more point? I'll be so fast. What? what? Say that again. <laughs> okay. Jane Sloba, 1330 South 177th Street. My petition, our petition, our grounds on the, on the um, boots on the ground, that petition, we just kind of went house to house. I started on the snowy day because everyone would be here, be home. It was wonderful. We got a lot. Um, then we, we walked it around. Everyone would sign it. Then people got on social media. Where can I sign? So I put it in my driveway, and a couple of us would stand there and hand it to people. Then I took it in. It was cold. People on Sunday were showing up at my door. They were not Spring Ridge residents. This is not a Spring Ridge issue. This affects thousands of people. There were people from Pacific Springs, which is, okay, here we go, which is across the street from Pacific. It was all the people from the Villas, all the people from, I think this is Banyan, Western Springs, the Ridges, Everyone got in their car, came to my driveway. Like I said, they were knocking on my door on Sunday. So I just put the table out again. I was going to be done yesterday and bring it down here. Can you leave it out? Can you leave it out? People were coming to my driveway until 8 o'clock last night. It is not a spring rid issue. This is, is affecting thousands of people. Older people, my sweet little Joanne Thorson, who is 90 years old, and, and the little ones. So it, it's just not a Spring Ridge. And you, you will see it on those addresses, and you have them right in front of you. Thank you. I promise that's it. <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? We're looking for new information, remember. I, I understand, and I don't want to be here. So um, Mindy Forel, 17513 William Circle. Did you say Mindy? Mindy, okay, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm in William Circle. So I'm up between 175th and 170. Well, I'll just Key show point you. point on that yeah, map. Sorry. I'm like right here. All right. OK, the morning traffic. It doesn't really impact me after school. It doesn't impact me. My kids are no longer at Spring Ridge. Why am I here? <laughs> because this project doesn't belong in this spot. And I'm going to make it quick. I know you said three minutes. It's a density issue when you look at it. If you drive by the spot, it's too small of a space for what they're proposing. There are very few apartments where you have to accommodate parking structures for this many residents. It, it speaks to the fact that it's a density issue. If, if other, other apartments have space to do the parking, they don't have the space, so they're going to take it up. Um, the other issue that I really want to address, and I know it's been addressed, but I'm going to say it in a different way, is the traffic. So I also disagree with the developer that the district doesn't care. The district steers clear of it. It's not that they don't care. So I think we need to be careful with our words. Just, I just wanted to make sure to make that statement. OK, so in the neighborhood, this area right here that she was talking about being a pain point is one of the areas that needs to be looked at for traffic. Somebody addressed it. There's an island, and you can see it there. As you come out onto Pacific and you go to turn left, you are backed up often here to get through 180th to go to wherever it is that you're going. You want to go to Elkhorn? and you want to go down 180th, you're going to sit there for I don't know how many lights. You're going to sit there and sit there. My other option is to go through Pacific Springs, which is already a high traffic area, and drive by all those neighbors' homes. This road hey, here. Mindy? Uh-huh. Over here. Yeah. Hey, um, so there's no arrow. Is that what you're saying on those lights? I, I mean, I was out there recently, but I, I can't remember. There is no arrow. OK. And so I could speak. I, I no, know you no, don't want to hear. No, no, that's OK. I, I just wanted to make no. sure, because that's why you have yes. to wait, because there's there's no arrow there. Okay. No, it's not just that there's no arrow, to be clear. It's also because there's too much traffic. So it's a very dangerous situation. And I don't want to say it's dangerous during school, because I feel like that will be dismissed as, that's only school, that's 20 minutes. I, my kids, we live close to school. I, my kids didn't, still don't walk to Erms, to the Elkhorn Ridge, because it's too dangerous crossing Pacific. So when I came home from work yesterday, I was coming up Pacific Street, and you have to stop about here as you come up on that hill because of the traffic. 
This was at three o'clock. So that traffic goes on from three o'clock until 6.30. It, it's, not, it's not just during an hour's worth of time. So I wanna be very careful when I talk about 180th to their traffic. The other day I'm down 180th heading south and the traffic is backed up to Village Inn on a one lane road heading down 180th. So when you're talking about adding 96 more units to that space and all that traffic, I'm not a resident on 177th. It's an issue, yes, but please don't dismiss what those people are saying as just they live on that road, it's an issue for them in the mornings. This is a traffic issue throughout this whole area. And as you come up to 180th right here in the mornings and after school, all kinds of parents shoot through here, they go past the good life, they go past the vet, and they come out right here because they're not gonna wait. Everyone's avoiding 180th Street because they know what 180th Street is like. Um, I just wanna be very careful. You also asked what kind of development should go there. No, no one was opposed to a church as far as I knew. There's also development that just went in and she addressed it, these villas that went in on Francis. No one in our neighborhood was opposed to those. It is a huge two lane road. There are no traffic issues. It was developed specifically with that in mind and it's not an issue. This space is too small for this project period. It just is. And if you're talking about not putting some sort of access out to Pacific for these 96 residents, it just isn't remotely feasible. I encourage you to drive by and you cannot have them coming out here with all the other traffic. These parents park here at the end of the school day to pick up their kids. Everybody knows parents. The parents don't stop here to pick up their kids. They park their cars way up to here. It's a two lane road. What happens? All the people coming over from here have nowhere to go because all these cars still need to get through. So you have cars stopped along Poppleton, back all the way this way, all of these cars and these cars. It, it is truly an issue and you have kids walking across from the daycare. So I just would encourage you to do a traffic study, do a water study, look at the area closely. It's not just residents on 177th Street who don't like traffic for 20 minutes in the day. Thanks. Thank you, Mindy. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, come forward. We've got the traffic. We, we understand <laughs> that. So. Thank you. Something I was thinking about listening to people. Hi, Jill Edstrand, 17630 Shirley Street. So I live opposite. I'm not worried too much about the traffic from school. My kids are older. Um, what I was thinking about when we were talking about parking, um, seems like we might have two parking spots per unit. Is that correct? I'm just thinking, okay, I have older kids in their early 20s. When they had friends over at our house, more cars. Where is all that parking going to go when people have visitors to those apartments? Is it going to go to the good life? Is it going to go down 177th? Is it going to go down 178th and block school traffic? So that, those streets aren't super wide. Um, that's my concern just when we're talking about a density perspective is I guess if you've been to other apartment units, I've, like I said, I have older kids. I've picked them up at other apartments occasionally. I've, you know, seen it. And it's just, where do you park if you're stopping and visiting? Where are you going to park? I'm not saying everyone's going to be there all at once using 192 spots, but if someone has a party there, you know, it, it will be dense. And that's just one more thing to think about. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Is that it? Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Uh, before we go any further, I want to uh, thank you for all of your arguments, for all of you that came down here today, took the time you know, off of work or whatever you're doing to come, come down here. I wanna thank you for the, um, oh, what's the correct word? I, I guess for the uh, decency of your arguments. There were a couple letters that I made copies of and, and that I didn't appreciate some of the comments or worries by some of the uh, residents. 
I didn't say it right to the uh, development team upstairs, but I told them if those comments come up, I'm not going to allow them to come up. And I, I appreciate uh, the level of your argument and, and you did a good job. Thank you for coming down. Uh, close the public hearing. Um, Ryan, did you want to come forward before I have Jeff Lake? Uh, that there's been a lot of talk about a traffic study. Ryan Haas from Public Works. Ryan Haas with Public Works Department. Um, there's been a lot of talk about a traffic study. Um, you talked about that in our pre-meeting. Would you share that yeah. information? Yeah, so the city, when we receive requests for projects, we evaluate how many additional new trips it's going to generate. And anything below 100 peak hour trips, a traffic study is not required. Um, in this case, we did take a look at it because of some of the, the uh, concerns that we had, had been hearing from the, from the property owners around in the vicinity. Um, and we, we took a look at what are the kinds of things that would be the outcome of a traffic study on a typical project. So when, this, when, I, when I say traffic study, it's an assessment of the operations of the streets adjacent to a project. So we measured the, the delay. We measure things like, do we need traffic signals? Do we need more turn lanes? Those are the improvements. That's the outcome of a traffic study, a traffic impact study as it relates to the development. So in this case, you know, if I guess in theory, if there hadn't been a signal before at 178th Street, sure, it would have been worth taking a look at. We already have traffic signals. We already have turn lanes on Pacific Street. We already have turn lanes on 178th. Uh, a lot of what, it, what, what I heard as I, as I saw, I was taking notes as I was hearing the testimony today, a lot of what I heard is, is one category would be Pacific Street and 180th Street are both, there's a lot of delay on those two uh, arterial streets. And, and that's a known issue. And, and to that extent, or to that point, we have two projects in the CIP, the City of Omaha CIP, uh, widening projects. The 180th Street project is identified as a project from Arbor Street to Harney Street. So it would basically be a full widening project to connect Dodge down to West Center. That is uh, coming up here in the next couple of years that will begin design. So again, this, that doesn't address the issues today, but it's, again, it's an, it's, we know it's an issue. It's something we intend to address as part of a city project in the future, hopefully the near future. The, the Pacific Street project is not identified for a specific year yet, but it is in the CIP, so it's more than just a conceptual project. So um, these growing pains, so to speak, are, are things that we experience in West Omaha, and it's just an unfortunate outcome of trying to catch up with the development trying to catch up with the infrastructure to serve the development that's out there. And you, you see it in lots of places. We just got 168 done in the last couple of years north of Dodge, for example. That one was a, a very busy corridor. Very, uh, it was over capacity. We've now addressed that. And it, it, so it's just in 168 just, just closed a few weeks ago. Uh, that's going to be one that we build here in the, in this year and next year. So, so that, the issues on 180th Street and Pacific Street, yes, they're known issues. Um, you know, just for, for reference, there's about, tw there's over 20,000 vehicles that go through the intersection of 180th Street and Pacific Street on a given day. That's over 3,000 vehicles in the PM peak hour. There's a lot of traffic there. Uh, this project, at the, conservatively, at the most, would generate something uh, along the lines of 50 to 60 vehicles in the PM peak hour. So just for reference, I mean, and that's not all going through 180th and Pacific. So I, I don't want to sit here and say we're not going to, we're not going to acknowledge that traffic will occur as part of this project. Of course it will. Um, anything that goes on the site, whether it's single family or a church or multifamily, is going to generate more traffic. It's going to add to delay at 178th Street. That's not something that's going to improve until the city widens Pacific Street, unfortunately, but that's the case in a lot of places in West Omaha. Now, as far as the school traffic concerns, um, again, I'm not going to stand here and say, uh, these additional trips won't potentially add to some of these issues or maybe increase the delay. Um, but I'm hearing issues that exist today. And if there's anything that can be done as far as enforcement for people driving the wrong way, if there's anything that can be done as far as maybe uh, considering additional changes to the, the characters of the street around there, 
the city of Omaha Public Works Department works with school districts all over the city to address those kind of issues. So with or without this project, if that's something that, that the neighborhood group wants to pursue, I, I don't know what those would be. I, you know, I'm not being intimately familiar with the, with the characteristics of the traffic flow in the neighborhood, but that's something that's on the table you know, that we'd, we'd certainly listen to and evaluate with or without a project here. So, so that all being said, that, that's kind of where the city comes from is knowing the number of trips that would be generated by the proposed development, it falls short of the threshold that we would require a traffic impact study. And even if we did require one, it's unlikely it would identify any improvements to offset the impacts. Thank you, Ryan. Let's say the city, whenever it happens, Pacific Street has widened from 180th to 178th. The intersection at 178th, where right now one of the concerns is there's only one lane going out. When that project does happen, does the city take that on then too, or who is, who's responsible for that intersection in all four directions? Typically, we do an analysis of a corridor to identify operations. We don't build it just for what's out there now. We want to project traffic and build the ultimate section. We only want to do a project once. So that's, that's something that's analyzed as far as the lanes on the approaches to the major street. So at that time, we'll take a look at, okay, if we widen the Pacific to four lanes with the left turn lanes, is, what, is 178th Street good enough for what we're going to see, let's say, in 2040 or 2050? And we, we project out those volumes and study that. So at that time, if another improvement is needed on the approach to 178th to meet future demand, That'll be something that'll be incorporated in the design. Okay. Hey, Ryan, on, is there a possibility that they could, until we get that project done on Pacific, is there a way to put an arrow uh, on there to maybe allow people to get out uh, and, and with, with new traffic possible, or new traffic with, if this is approved, is, is that a possibility so that we can, you know, maybe get some yeah. of these people out of there faster? Yeah. As a temporary until, you know, Temporary or otherwise, and, and just to, to again reiterate, as with the school issues, whether this project proceeds or not, if if there's a request from the from the neighbors, if, if they want us to take a look at what's out there now, I, one of the things going on here is we are seeing a shift in in the traffic patterns because we closed 168th. I mean that's a lot of people trying to find different different places now here since uh, I think early January when we closed it. Um, with that in mind, with or without. 168th closure with or without this proposed project. If there's a request from the neighborhood, we can go take a look and adjust the signal timing, um, whether that means a, a shifting time around in the signal cycle to, to serve more on 178th or more in Pacific, that's, we can look at that. And that, that can include uh, potentially evaluation of a, of a left turn arrow. Yeah. Anything else for Ryan? Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Jeff. Did you want to come up? I saw you making notes. Is it you or Jim that's going to address that, or both of you? Uh, Jeff Lake, 2108, um, 21008 Cumberland Drive. Um, but yeah, I had a couple items listening to the, the, the testimonies and maybe clarify a couple of items. Uh, I also had a kind of a school circulation map. I think that's obviously um, you know, an issue that we've all observed. Uh, the one thing that, that I've noticed, um, I, I went out three different times over this past week to just kind of observe traffic flow and, you know, where are the pinch points, where are the issues. Uh, only one of those times did I go down by the school. It was definitely a, an issue down there, and I said, I don't, I'm probably in the way. I'm not going to do that again. So I kind of sat up by our project site and just watched and observed traffic flow. And the one item I noticed on Poppleton Avenue, which is the circulation path with 178th Street, being a one-way north, much of the traffic from the north side of Pacific for kids coming and in, in being dropped off at school came down Poppleton, went down 177th Street, came off the, the deal there. I think most of the videos that you had seen were down in this area. There wasn't any presented that were on Poppleton. Uh, that's where I studied most of it. It's right adjacent our project. Every time I was out there, I saw free moving traffic from Poppleton and down to 177th, there was no um, you know, bumper to bumper traffic congestion there. I do believe the neighbors are correct. That all occurs down and around this pinch point. Uh, but I did not see any, any traffic flow issues in the three times that I were out there. Uh, as far as trip generation, uh, you know, Ryan's correct on that. Um, the, the data I pulled on that, I'm also a licensed engineer. I went to the IT uh, manuals and, and pulled the data on that. 
uh, in the a.m. peak hours. Uh, I'll pull this up as well. Uh, it might be hard to see. A.m. peak hour times, which is again that one hour, worst hour between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. and between uh, 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. I looked at the a.m. peaks. There is, according to this, there's in 96 units, there are nine cars coming in and 26 cars coming out. So according to the manuals, it says one every two minutes or so, a little over two minutes, we're going to have a car exiting out in the morning hours that could be competing with school traffic. And I think it's also important to know um, at this 178th Street connection uh, for our proposed project, when I was out there looking those three times, I did not see enough delay at the intersection where cars were backed up past the connection over to the commercial. So that would allow for the vehicles that are exiting in the morning to, to leave the site and uh, get out to Pacific Street, acknowledging there's at times of days issues, macro level issues on both 180th and Pacific. We just didn't believe that the traffic in the morning peaks was gonna be um, significantly impacted by our project. Um, stormwater was another one that I, I heard as well. Uh, that is an item that before we obtain any sort of building permit, there's a review process of the city and public works. We're required to have no net increase in stormwater, which you're probably aware of, for a two-year storm, a 10-year storm, and a 100-year storm, as well as water quality requirements. Uh, we are working through those details with our team, and certainly we'll have that all worked out uh, before we'd submit for building permits. Uh, I, there's one other comment that said about parking. There's a couple on those on parking. Uh, we do have all surface parking. There's no parking decks or parking structures. Um, and where we're at, there's 156 uh, parking stalls required by code, according to our unit counts from what I've seen, and we're in excess of that. So we are cognizant of the fact that there are sometimes guests and a minimum sometimes aren't, aren't you know, exactly ideal. We've provided as many as we can beyond that. Uh, and the other one, I think from um, Ms. Matikowicz's uh, comments there about zoning regulators, we do believe, and we have not done the formal site plan yet with the city site plan review, but we do believe the new plan that we have prepared uh, will adhere to adhere to the R6 um, site regulators in addition to meeting the density for an R6 zoning classification, which I believe maybe this is an Eric question. I believe that R6 is still classified as a low density, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's probably in inconsequential. It's still 96 units is, is what we're proposing, independent if it's R7 or R6. And, and we are comfortable with the R, um, R6 zoning designation. Um, with that, that was my list. Did you guys have other questions of me or of Jim? Jeff, I I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. So I just have one, a couple, maybe a couple questions for you. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I worry a little bit about what we're seeing here are the overabundance, what I'll call overabundance of apartment buildings, new apartments coming online. And maybe there's a demand for it, but there's some point there's gonna be a saturation mm -hmm. point for apartments, I would think with the amount of construction of apartments that are going on in the city. Um, have you done any kind of a study to know what the vacancy rates are in that general area for apartments? Do we know? You know, I've not looked at exact vacancy rates, no. Uh, we, we hire Lund Company as our management company. Uh, we ask them to kind of review market conditions, go through those sort of items for us, uh, critique our rents. Uh, you know, what are the market rates for rents? What are those vacancies? Um, every bit of indication we've seen from them is this is this is a good project, a good location, and an underserved specific little module of, of town. As um, was brought up earlier, the you know the master plan here calls that there can be 350 units on this uh, this uh, intersection in and around it. Uh, there's zero. Uh, furthermore, one of the reasons we like this site is it is close to goods and services. It's close to grocery. It's close to uh, you know bars and grills, it's close to daycares, it has a lot of those items to where you don't have to drive, you know, 20, 30 minutes in the morning to go, uh, you know, obtain or in the afternoon or even throughout the day to obtain those goods and service. So, so we believe this is a, a very attractive site for that transition from commercial into, um, you know, the single family residential. And I believe the nearest apartment complex to this project is 180th and Dodge, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe yeah, on, and maybe on 100, 192nd Pacific, and, and Pacific, mm -hmm, too. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And there's some down 100 and, um, 192nd, 192nd and center as well, I believe. Yeah. So there's no major complexes, you know, of, you know, three, four, 500 units other than 180th and Dodge. I right. believe that's the closest large complex. Hey, Jeff, uh, Colton had brought up something about pet relief. Mm -hmm. uh, will you have your own, will you allow pets and then will you have your own grounds that they, they can 
take care of their business on, on your own property? Yeah, great point on that. So pets are, are unfortunately in the apartment industry, something that's, that's there. Uh, if you don't allow them, uh, there's asterisks there for service pets and they end up there anyway. So you might as well plan for it. Uh, there are restrictions on size of pets that, that you can have and breeds of pets and numbers of pets. And with that, anytime there's a pet, there's an additional uh, deposit that comes with that, an additional rate per month for that. And we typically provide those, uh, you know, those dog run facilities. Now, we haven't shown our amenities package. That's another thing we're working on with our, with our team. The two areas that make sense to us for having amenities packages, and, and that may be the dog run, it may be um, you know, little grills, little benches, other areas that are uh, for the use of the uh, multifamily community. This is a location, um, and this is another location. Um, I do want to mention from our conversations with the Villa Association, uh, we had we had committed that we understand there's some there's there's some trees there now, but we understand that you know we're we're new or by them, and we we're going to work with them on uh, additional landscaping and working through what that looks like to kind of help down uh, cut down their visibilities, as well as working through kind of the construction um, sites and noises. Uh, so that all kind of ties together. There's still some, some details we have to work out. We plan on working through that, certainly between now and the council and through the life of the project with both associations. Um, Jeff, there's just going through my list here. I know Judd and Danielle were talking about home values. I don't know if I should, can add, if you would know how to answer that. But uh, mm -hmm. Jane talked about trash at three o'clock in the morning and light spill over we do have the dark sky uh statutes in um so that wouldn't be a, a problem your trash mm -hmm. i don't know if anybody has trash at three o'clock maybe they do but i i have not seen that and those are things yeah. we can we can correct if it ever becomes a problem and we have had that conversation as well with the memory care facility on sensitivity to their patients and noise and time so we've had that um you mentioned property values. I'm not an appraiser, so I probably shouldn't completely comment on that. I am also a licensed real estate agent. You know, I've, I've seen these projects, um, you know, for number, numerous times, been on both sides of them. Um, I've not seen that as a, as a major, um, you know, influence on property values and the, the percentages and the dollar amounts they're quoting. But uh, again, I'm not an appraiser. I'm maybe not the best person to ask. All right, thank you. And then um, one last thing. Um, you had made the comment about the schools and the schools didn't care and Mindy made the comment that the schools do care. I'm, I'm not certain I'm, mm -hmm. how that gets put together, what's right sure. there. I don't know as though I, and if I did say that exactly, that wasn't the intent. I believe I had comment that they, they had no objection to it and that that wasn't their job and their job was to educate kids. That was the message I got That's from the, the school district. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't that they don't care because I'm sure they do, but that wasn't their job. In your talks with the school uh, system, uh, Elkhorn Schools, this does not affect, well, we've got a lot of neighbors saying, well, this is not your problem, I guess. Mm -hmm. so we got a lot of neighbors saying that Spring Ridge mm -hmm. is, is too full. But yeah, Elkhorn Public Schools didn't address that with you. They did not bring that up okay. as that. It's concerning with this project because you're bringing more kids and it's going to you know flood our already restricted school they didn't make any mention of that okay i spoke with ryan lindquist uh, in the administrative office and then he reached out and spoke with another person in the administration to com confirm the cycle or the uh, traffic circulation patterns that they were accurate from what he told me and, and, I, and, and I might be able to speak a little bit to the school because yeah, I've, I've had enough experience building school buildings um being on school board millard our calculation is that an apartment complex will yield 0.1 to 0.2 kids per unit. So if you got 96 units, you can expect maybe 9 to 10, maybe 11 kids at the most coming out of the apartment complex. So it's not a lot with some, but it's not a lot. But they don't yield that many children, obviously. Mm -hmm. And as far as property values, again, people want to live by schools. And they're in demand, and if you are near a school, I don't care if it's a middle school, a high school, or elementary school, people will come to the prop. There's an, it's an attraction for people to move there. So I don't think the property values are going to be affected negatively by the apartment complex coming in, just because of the schools that are in that area. So those are just my comments with regards to that. Yeah, Jeff, I just have a question. I know um, this isn't a site, a full site plan yet. 
But mm -hmm. what are you contemplating for the uh, storm retention? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the area that with the front yard removing the parking on the front, this seemed like a, a, a logical place to put it. It's also the low side of the site and also mentioning there's a public storm line that runs right to the west of that area. It seems logical. The daycare uh, has their facility between their parking lot and the street and the memory care facility, I believe, was put in before the regulations were enacted. I've not seen, unless it's underground, that they had um, had a facility there. So if we can't meet it in this green space, we've either got to kind of spread it throughout the project and have multiple little low points depressions, or we've got to put it underground uh, underneath the parking lots to, to accommodate that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Jim, did you want to add anything? Thank you, Jim Boozier, 10250 Regency Circle. Just a, just a couple quick points, and um, I think that the, the planning department will speak to the, the issue of master plan compliance, so I would, I guess I would beg to differ from Mike's analysis there that um, I do believe that this project is master plan compliant, and I think that's consistent with the recommendation as well. Um, the other, the other uh, point, and again, I'm not, trying to pick fights here, but there was a comment made that the memory care was opposed to the to this project, and I don't think that was accurate. Uh, Jeff has had discussions with memory care as late as today, and uh, they are not, uh, they're not opposed to the project. I mean, he's talked to the ownership of the, of the memory care facility. So that's really all I had to add. Thank you. Right. Um, a couple people raised their hands. Uh, what we generally do so once I close the public hearing, we always give the development team a chance to come up and rebut any arguments that have been made. Uh, since there's so many of you, I see Michael's got his hand up. Did you wanna, I will call you up if you'd like to come up and Real make, quick. okay, quick. yeah, if you could keep it quick, please. Absolutely, thank you. All right. Again, Mike Matukowitz, 8701 West Dodge Road, Omaha, Nebraska, 68114. Uh, I'm not an engineer, uh, wish I were. Uh, but Jeff had mentioned some statistics. I referred to the ITE trip generation report, 10th edition, it's current as of 2018. It says apartments, condos, and townhomes are expected to yield seven trips per day, which would equal 672 here, or 0.7 per peak hour, which would be 67 trips, so a little higher numbers than, than Jeff had referenced. And I think the difference uh, here could be even higher because when you take into consideration the books say what the books say, but here we're looking at what is this site? And again, you have a unique site here with a middle school, a grade school, a uh, daycare facility, actually two daycare facilities, a high volume grocery store. So again, it's a high volume congested area. The overall density of the area is very thick. Uh, again, it just appears that this is not the right project at the right time for this site. Again, we respectfully ask that you uh, reject the application. Thank you. Right, thank you, Michael. Um, any additional comments or questions from the board before we hear from Eric? It, I, I, I'll just make a general comment statement here. First of all, thank you. Thank you for coming out and participating in the process. It's, it's important that we hear you and, you know, we got a lot of paper from you. I am very familiar with the area. I drive it frequently. I know what you're talking about with regards to traffic. I am frustrated by it. Uh, I've expressed that many times to, to Public Works as well. Not just that area, but it's all over, um, particularly West Omaha, a lot of areas in West Omaha. So I am sympathetic to your concern. I sat through the signal on 180th and Pacific Street the other morning. I think there were four, I think there were four turns of the traffic signal before I finally got through that intersection there, going north on 180th Street. So I understand what you're talking about with regards to that. Um, It's a, I, I'm, you know, I'm leaning both ways. I'm, I'm sympathetic to your concern, but I understand the development. I get it. I know what it's about. I don't think it's going to be that detrimental to the area. I really don't. Um, I do worry about public safety. I do worry about kids. I do worry about the you know, kids that walk into school. But 
that that traffic pattern I think that exists right now and I look again I look at the circulation of the school there and it's just not easy to get in and out of there it's just not an easy process you've got a street right to the uh, east of it that that you know doesn't allow it just backs up there so I am sympathetic to that but I think this development you know I'd love to see villas too if I could convince my wife to move into a villa we'd move into a villa you know today if we could but I can't convince her to move but Villas would be nice, but I don't know if it's conducive to the developer to, to develop uh, uh, villas on that site. The church I know was there. It was, I saw the sign there for several years. Would have been nice to have that church. Um, unfortunately, that church wasn't able to, to come to, um, to, 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 to the table with the plans, with the original plans. So um, we hear you. We really do. But this is difficult for us to make a decision on this as well, because I think we all hear you pretty well but we can't stop a development necessarily that makes sense and conforms. And you're gonna talk about a little bit because I think Mike, Mike brought up some points about not meeting the master plan, conforming with the master plan. As long as it meets all the requirements, we can't stop development necessarily. So I am torn, um, but I do appreciate you guys coming out. I really do, and um, we'll see how it ends up. Thank you. Any other comments? I just wanted to say this before we hear from Eric is that I um, shared this in the pre-meeting in the spirit of uh, Chris Carnes that just left our board. She always spent a lot of time that when people would buy a home or something and they, they take the time to look at the zoning around them, that's important. And uh, it was always important and I uh, to Chris and um, I, I grabbed Chelsea Carlgard. Where are you, Chelsea? Oh, there you are. I grabbed your letter because it said in there, I uh, researched extensively the zoning of that plot of land. It being R4 was one of the biggest factors to why, why I chose to purchase my home. It was one of, the, one of the most significant parts of my financial investment into my home. So when Mike Pate, says we hear you it's hard decision it is a hard decision we make zoning changes every now and then and we've turned down zoning changes every now and then and um, i i still don't know what i'm going to do here it's a hard decision hard decision to make eric sorry to interrupt no sir you can't so i'm sorry you sir you so cannot you interrupt i'm sorry Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Specifically for the master plan, uh, there, there's a lot of things in a, in a city's master plan, okay? There's different elements, um, but it's, it's very clear cut that this proposed project is master plan compliant. The land use element specifically states that multifamily projects within a quarter mile of a mixed use intersection or adjacent to the office commercial portion of that intersection can allow a certain number of multifamily units when it's adjacent to or within. The intersection of 180th and Pacific is, a, is called a neighborhood mixed use center which allows up to 30 acres of office and commercial. Currently there's about 28 and a half um, acres that are zoned office or commercial. The proposed project is located immediately adjacent to commercial zoning directly to the west, as well as commercial zoning directly to the north. Um, there are currently zero multifamily units at, that go towards the 180th Pacific intersection. Obviously, we talked about where the other apartments are. You know, it, it, you get out to 192nd and Pacific, which has a different intersection count and, and number of units. You have, you know, all the major intersections in our city, there's usually a mixed use intersection that allows the office commercial or multifamily in some capacity. So for this specific intersection, um, we, you know, the tricky thing about our land use map, which <laughs> only tells part of the story, if you look at this map, and we don't have it in front of us, but maybe somebody showed it, um, it does show up as yellow, which is low density residential. However, that's only part of the story. There's other components talked about in the master plan. Like I just said, when it's directly adjacent to the office commercial, it's allowed the multifamily. So it's not shown as a multifamily designation and color on the map. So the map is only telling part of the story. But it's very clear that the master plan, we looked at it in the pre-meeting, 
you know, I showed you the different diagrams of where you can do it and, and the exact language. Um, so absolutely, it's master plan compliant. Multiple family residential zoning is allowed in R6, R7, or R8 zoning designations, along with some others, office and commercial. But for residential zoning specifically, R6 through R8 is the zoning that's appropriate for apartment units. <clears throat> Any one of those can be requested. The, the, the main difference between R6, R7, and R8 is about density. Okay, so everyone has their own perception of, of what a dense project is. Obviously, we've worked on some very dense projects um, and approved dense projects in different parts of the city. You know, it's a little bit different in suburbia. You know, you have your standard R6 or R7 zoning that's appropriate. But yeah, there are parts of our city that we, that we approve projects that are very dense or they're on transit corridors and, and, and such as that. So um, as far as density, the main difference between R6 and R7 um, R6 zoning requires 2,000 square foot site area per unit, which comes out to about 22 units per acre. R7 is basically double that. It requires 1,000 square, um, square foot site area per unit, or about 44 units per acre. So, um, you know, the request before us is to R7. The applicant sounds like they're willing to go to R6, which, you know, either one is appropriate, um, you know, as far as the master plan is concerned. So there's also the existing MCC overlay designation that has been put in place on the site since 2013. The MCC overlay um, requires the highest level of building material design for buildings that we have in our uh, zoning code for um, areas, you know, most parts of the city is our highest level of design. Um, so that is already in place. So there are um, additional landscaping requirements as well with that MCC overlay, as well as those higher level of design requirements. Um, so the, the, the site plan that's been proposed to staff, and there was a new one that the applicant presented, with a rezoning request, it does not lock down a specific site plan, okay? So, um, you know, we've provided feedback on the, on the previous plan, and I anticipate if this moves forward that we would um, continue to coordinate with the developer in applying the applicable zoning regulations, whether that's the number of parking stalls, landscaping requirements, uh, buffer yard provisions, heights of structures. There's, you know, the whole, you know, there's a whole document of zoning codes that, that we apply to projects. Um, but a site plan is not specifically locked down. So I just want to, you know, make that aware. Obviously the applicant um, has shown their intentions of what they're building, but, um, you know, there was a few comments about you know, the specific plan. So I just wanted to mention, mention that. As far as touching briefly back on the master plan, this is a system that we've been utilizing for over two decades. You know, I, there is a lot of case history on this site. In fact, our case history goes back to 1996 when the original neighborhood was platted. Part of that request, it was to rezone to R4, R5, and R6. The R6 was supported by staff I think there was a condition by city council to, um, you know, to have a specific site plan that locked it down. That's going back to 96. Obviously, nothing was built on this site. Uh, later on, 1998, the memory care was zoned R5. 2002, there was a church proposed, never was built. 2012, there was R6 zoning that was approved for convalescent services for the western half of the site, including the daycare. When the church proposal, a different church proposal came back in 2013, they had to consolidate the zoning to one district. So uh, rather than take it all to R6 and, and have neighbors come and oppose it, they took it all to R4 and that's when the MCC overlay was in place and so on. So uh, there, there is history of, um, that goes back 20 years for this specific site that there is support from staff level for the R6 zoning. Um, I'm not gonna get into traffic very much except for I understand it. I live one block from an Elkhorn Elementary School, different location. Uh, my street is one of the streets that has one-way traffic twice a day, so I understand. Also, my neighborhood does not have through routes to the adjacent arterial, so <laughs> the direction that we do go is, um, there is difficult traffic that, that we deal with, and I know Public Works has worked with our neighborhood and the other neighborhoods on timing, so I encourage if, you know, to continue to do that, whether this project proceeds or not. 
Um, so definitely work with them because they can they can definitely try to help alleviate. You know, they, they don't have fix all for for all issues, but I just want you to know that that I am aware um, of the challenges that that brings. But that being said, there are specific development rights that these um, that land has, and that we as staff apply the rules and regulations that have been approved by previous city councils, zoning code requirements, subdivision code requirements, stormwater code requirements, lighting requirements. So our job is to analyze a specific project and that compliance with city codes and, and this project is that. So I can answer any questions. Oh, one more thing. I, I also, I, I appreciate the comment that Greg had said about being a very cordial crowd. We've had nasty <laughs> public testimony before on apartments or other projects, cell towers, different cases. Um, you know, I would just encourage that if this project, you know, goes forward to, you know, to welcome them as part of the neighborhood. You know, sometimes these apartment, uh, you know, these apartment dwellers, most of us have probably lived in an apartment at some point in our lives. You know, they may like the area, move into a home that one of you may be selling or perhaps you would have elderly family that move into the apartment to be close. So I would just encourage, you know, welcome to the neighborhood. And I know that doesn't alleviate all the traffic concerns, but just wanted to point that out. So with that being said, um, staff is recommending approval of the rezoning to R7. The board does have the ability to deny R7 and approve R6. You can go lower, you can't go more intensive, so you couldn't go to R8. Um, but because the proposal is specifically for R7, staff is recommending approval. Okay, any comments before I ask for a motion? Okay, do we have a motion? So Dave, if you could deny R7 and recommend approval for R6 it would be cleaner. Okay, and then I would recommend denial of the R7. And then recommend, do I have separate, do I have to do, do it separately? Do we need to take a vote on R? Do we need to? Jennifer, could you nod your head, separate votes or one action, or one vote on the action? It was deny of R7, approve R6. It's going to take separate votes. Okay. okay. Jennifer is with our law department. We just have to space out with COVID, due to COVID. The, to deny R7. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Franklin? Yes. Cotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion to deny is approved. I'll make a motion to approve. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Sotolongo? Yes. Rose, Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Maybe. <laughs> you want me to come back to you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion to approve R6 is approved. So I'll just reiterate that the final action is taken at City Council. Um, there will be the same notifications that are sent out for Planning Board that would be officially sent out uh, to adjacent neighborhood, ad adjacent neighbors within 300 feet. The date of the City Council um, public hearing is not known at this time just because we have documents that route and, and scheduling requirements. So just wanted to make put that on the record. Okay. All right, I think that's the end of the agenda. Do we have a motion on the minutes from our pre minute our pre minute our pre meeting minutes? I have a motion to approve the pre meeting minutes from January. Yes. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote please? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Cotolongo? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. 
Motion approved. Do we have a motion on our public meeting minutes from January? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Tate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. For Sotolongo? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Do we have a motion for adjournment? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, yes. will you record the vote, please? <laughs> Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Tate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Sotolongo? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion to adjourn at 449 approved.